got to sit with that math for a minute and just let it sink into your bones. And it's a staggering number. One out of every three people in the US, all their productive output for 50 years was literally stolen at the press of a button through the counterfeiting of currency. The fact that money is basically the finite energy that you expend in your finite time, the fact that that is corrupted, I would say is the biggest spiritual crime that has been done to us. How did the price of eggs go from $2 a dozen four years ago to $12 a dozen today? Are the chickens laying eggs more slowly? Like what happened? Does a tree need more sunlight to create the same apple? I hope you can find more examples to show people that it's the thing that we price it in that is actually the problem. Of course prices are supposed to go down. We're solving problems better, faster, cheaper over time. When you hear the thoughts in your head, do you realize that you are not the one talking? So you also are not your thoughts, however bad the thoughts might be. But then you also start seeing that in other people, other people that talk a lot about other people. Every observation or judgment is simultaneously a confession of character. So what triggers you is actually what you don't like about yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Bitcoin's something that is extremely valuable once you come to understand it. Uh, but there's a lot of people in the world that still believe that it's not valuable. And then you have people literally saying like it has no value, no market value, not worth anything. Um, you know, despite the fact that it trades 24 by seven and has an actual market capitalization, people still ha somehow have this opinion, which is crazy. Maybe it's a misunderstanding of the word value itself. Mm. Uh, which is quite a deep topic. So what are your views on value? Like how do we define it? What is the what are yeah. the philosophical implications of this word? What does it mean to have value, to be valuable? Well, I, I kind of approach it from I think my perspective that I learned in, in digital startups and, and business where companies have a value proposition. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you have a startup or you start a startup, the idea is usually about some product that is like an end product that uh, exists in the in the future mm -hmm. but and, and a lot of people think about what should i price this product right and they they, they think about pricing etc but i always told the people that that i worked with well if you ask for money what is the proposed value that that you deliver mm -hmm. and a lot of people get stuck on that because the value is not necessarily you know um, when someone has a, a microphone you know it is the microphone mm -hmm. no it helps you create a podcast, right? Or mm -hmm. do what you love or something like that. And so I like when we talk about value, we talk about value, let's talk about value proposition. Mm -hmm. So what's the pro proposed value that something or someone brings to you? But value is always perceived value mm -hmm. because you as the provider of the value, me as the person who asks for it, it's your task to figure out what I actually want. Mm -hmm. So if I say what I want, is that really what what I want? And that's kind of up to you as the provider to yeah. to figure out. So I think value is is a perceived value that we agree upon mm. when we have when we agree on a value exchange. So mm. in in all my examples when I talk about Bitcoin. And I don't know how I, I got I got to that, but I talk about uh, building a shed in a backyard. So if I wanna want a shed in my backyard, and I ask a few people like, do you wanna build a shed for me? Then some people will say, well, I can do this for $1,200 units mm -hmm. or euro units or a thousand, et cetera. And let's say you propose how you would build this this shed mm -hmm. for me. And I like what you, what you propose. Then when we shake hands and we agree on the amount of units, maybe you ask a thousand, I say 800 and you say, well, I do it for nine. And mm -hmm. I say, okay, when mm -hmm. we shake hands at that moment, we agree on the value that's going to be exchanged. Yeah. That's kind of how I approach it. So I don't think it's a very hard thing. I don't mm -hmm. think price is value. Yeah. So when we talk about Bitcoin and people talk about the price, I don't think that is the value, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's also a little bit of a trap because sometimes people say there's no intrinsic value, uh -huh. right? But I don't think anything has really intrinsic value. Maybe oxygen and CO2. Have, <laughs> I don't know. No, that's, yeah, it's a good start. I, um, I agree that intrinsic value is, doesn't exist because value is occurring between things, right? It's between a human 
and their purpose and their aim, their goal, yeah. and the things that either accelerate them on the path toward that goal or block them along that path. You know, yeah. th- those things are destructive to value. The things that move you further along the path are valuable, basically. Ayn Rand has a great definition. She said that uh, value is that which man acts to gain or keep. So it's, re- it's really, I think, only through human action that value is imputed to anything whatsoever. Yeah. But then the game becomes, well, that's obviously inherently subjective, right? What the table I'm using to rest my drink, if, so, if you're being paid to jump over it, becomes an obstacle to you. Like it's not, the table doesn't have any inherent value. It's dependent on the path of goal-directed action that I'm on versus you are on versus anyone else is on. But the game we need to, to play with one another is how do we, a proc, we need to have a social appraisal of the, the resources um, necessary to accomplish those things, right? And that's mm. what pricing is basically. It's sort of the, here's an estimate for the resources necessary to solve this problem. Yeah, but pricing comes after the value is clear. That's what I'm I saying. Say, it's right? just an approximation yeah. of value. A certain judgment at a yeah. certain moment. Yeah, I, w- I would translate that quote into value is something that I want. Yes, yeah, it's a but, preference. Yeah. yeah. But what do I want? <laughs> yeah, or a problem you want solved. Yeah, right. Yeah, but if there's, if we use price, you know, or or money to price the value, I think that's where we get into the territory of if there's bad money. Yes. And things are cheap, for example. Right. It doesn't necessarily mean that because I can buy them that they are good or they bring value to that's right. to my life. Yes. Yeah, and then the the intrinsic value fallacy i think what people actually mean when they say that is that it has some industrial use value you know that the economists separate industrial use mm. value like something you can consume or use as a tool to build something else that you can ultimately consume or there's also monetary use value you don't hold money for purposes of consuming it mm-hmm. you hold it for purposes of trading with someone in the future yeah i agree and so that that's still a problem right you need yeah. we need to have something yeah. to hold as yeah. like an you know basically the call option that you can take into the marketplace and get anything that you need it's it's the it's optionality basically and when the future is uncertain you need some degree of just pure optionality to deal with an uncertain future yeah like of course you want to invest somewhat and maybe you want to buy a factory and tools but what if people stop buying what your factory is putting out or they stop the tools become irrelevant because of innovation mm mm-hmm. Well, you could be left holding nothing, but if you're holding money, it's like, well, you can still buy the new thing that made your old factory obsolete. So there's this strange, like... It's all risk, eventually, yeah. also. I, I like that topic, too. I think the intrinsic value mainly comes from the people that like gold. Yeah, for and, sure. And use it as an argument against Bitcoin yeah. to some degree, like, oh, gold has these properties that uh, that it's used in electronics and, yes. and or, uh, there's jewelry yeah. you know but that still is also a, a choice right i and want that's a gold flaw jewelry. i would say in gold yeah, <laughs> yeah as money at least yeah as yeah. money yeah yeah it's this lame excuse to a degree uh before we recorded we, we talked about um you know the, the the different arguments that people have against um Bitcoin, and then eventually when they use an argument like, uh, you know, what if uh, the, all of the internet shuts off, it's kind of like, you know, that, that mm-hmm. is your last argument. But I feel the same as with with, with gold. I think I, I don't have anything against gold, but yeah, for me as like a young millennial guy, like I don't understand the, the shiny rock aspect and it's fine if, if people um, think it's valuable. But yeah. what I think with gold, and that also is to a degree a, a problem eventually with fiat money, it's all narrative. Mm-hmm. It's nothing mm-hmm. verifiable, you know. It's like uh, it's been used for five thousand years, yeah. But yeah. maybe there wasn't anything better to use. Now that we have something better to use, you should look at that from from a distance and just park that narrative to see what can I verify of these these assets. Yes, and what could be better better money eventually also. Yeah, it's it's a hilarious argument with the gold bugs because we're all agreed about sound money and you know yeah. all the principles, yeah. but then the actual uh, implementation of those principles, there's there's mm-hmm. a disagreement. Yeah, but I'm I'm I mean I think gold will persist for a long time for the reason you just said. It's been around for five thousand plus years. That's really what that when I when I say what makes it valuable, I'm going to try to be careful here. That's why people find it useful. 
for storing purchasing power into the future. It's like, because it's been doing that really well for 5,000 years. Yeah. And sure, like maybe, like, obviously I'm much more of a Bitcoiner. I hold more of my purchasing power in Bitcoin than I do physical gold. But that's not to say something couldn't take out Bitcoin, right? The future is uncertain. We have no idea. And in those, you know, black swan type scenarios, physical gold would be the next natural alternative. Um, but <laughs> this, if you go into that more, it's like, well, why did gold serve as such a highly functional money for 5,000 years? Yeah. And you get to the properties of money, right? The properties that make gold good money. I actually think that is the best way to come to the realization of why Bitcoin is the best money that there will ever be because you start evaluating it on its actual uh, properties, right? The actual affordances that the money gives you, I, yep. you know, divisibility, durability, et cetera. And so the, what, the summation of this is something like, you know, once you understand why gold became money, then you'll sell all of your gold and buy Bitcoin. You know, it's like that type of thing. But there's still, as you said, it all comes down to risk, right? There's still certain risk in Bitcoin. Yeah that aren't in gold and vice versa, right? Yeah. I also think there's a big risk that's not talked about enough in gold, and that is if we do compromise the supply integrity, either through lab-grown gold, asteroid mining, ocean floor mining, whatever innovation, mm. if we learn how to make gold a lot more cheaply, well, then it's not going to work as a store value anymore. Yeah. And so it could just get disrupted. Yeah. And um, But Bitcoin if it continues to function as it is, doesn't suffer that risk because the 21 million is fixed at the social layer. It's not a physical, it's not in the physical world. It's fixed at the, the, the social layer, basically. Well, this is why I think Bitcoin podcasts are so good and we should never stop stop talking about <laughs> Bitcoin because the narrative in gold is very strong, right? It, if you want to verify gold, you need like three machines. You need to drill in it, right? You need yeah. chemicals, you need all these things. And I think that's a very rational I almost want to say like argument against gold or gold being inferior to to Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But it seems like that argument isn't really that strong for people that are uh, uh, proponents of, of gold, right? And what I love so much about Bitcoin is that everything is verifiable. It's not mm -hmm. only talk, right. it's also the walk. Yes, yeah. 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 And I think that is eventually what we should keep talking about is that that part of Bitcoin. It's not... You know, it's not a better money because you say so mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. I say so. Mm -hmm. I always also say on my podcast, like, please don't believe me or believe yeah. the person that I'm talking to. Like the, a conversation like this is an invitation to people listening to figure it out for themselves. Absolutely. And they they can, right? And Absolutely. I think that's the difference with, with gold or any other thing. It's just like you know, two weeks ago, I, I talked to a guy who, who sold his company a few years back, has, has a lot of money. And we talked about Bitcoin. He didn't have any Bitcoin. So I said, well, what are you doing to protect your wealth? And he's like, yeah, I'm really big into real estate. Uh -huh. And then I said, okay, maybe, maybe this is a stupid question, but why? Uh -huh. And he was silent. He, he fought for a very long time. He said, I actually don't really know. Uh -huh. It's because other people are doing it. I yeah, said, okay, imitation. but how do, you feel, how do you feel about it? Like, is it, is it fun, nice, or does it give you a headache? Or <laughs> do you sleep better at night? Because Bitcoin makes me yeah. sleep better at night. And he was very intrigued by that because he said, I do have a lot of headaches. So we talked for two hours or something, right. but eventually said, uh, he asked me like, what should I study? So I sent him uh, videos to study, but he came to the realization that although he is very smart, intelligent, hardworking, entrepreneurial guy who got rewarded for you know selling a, a company, mm -hmm. that he was now doing something that he did not enjoy. Mm -hmm. And he did also not know why, mm -hmm. why he was doing it. And I loved taking that approach, mm. you know, when you talk about money or wealth preservation or growing your wealth, like what do you believe, what do you think is, is true, which path to follow, and less the pitch of Bitcoin with all the verifiability and, and stuff like that, because that comes after. That's yeah, the yeah, kind yeah. of the proof of, yeah. of the talk up front yeah. is that there's also a walk, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's fantastic. And it's um, the whole top-down versus bottom-up approach, mm -hmm. right? Some people resonate more with the theoretical down to the practical, but some people you just need to meet them where they're at, right? Yeah. Well, uh, hence the name, the name of the show. I think exactly. this is what, what drew me in. That's exactly it. That, you was know, all, that was the idea, at least. Is Of course, yeah. And and I have a, I have a fun example, I think. Like uh, when I was 30, I, uh, I worked at a big bank. 
I was already into Bitcoin. I had a mortgage. Mm -hmm. And then at one point I had a colleague who told me, did you know that the money in the bank is not yours? And I said, what, like, mm -hmm. what, what, what are you talking about? And we had lunch for like an hour and he explained fractional reserve banking to me. And that, you know, when you have physical money, but then when you deposit it in the bank, that it's not contractually, it's not yours anymore, mm -hmm. you know, and the bank lends it out and all these things. I, I walked away from that conversation feeling pretty stupid, like I'm participating <laughs> in something that I don't mm -hmm. even understand. And I'm into Bitcoin and I work at a bank, you know. And I think that's around the time also when I found, you know, your 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 podcast. And mm -hmm. I think just that that title really resonates with everyone because you don't nobody teaches you what that is. And so even if you're interested, even if you're interested in finance or economics, uh, I talked to a guy on my podcast who's a master of economics and he told me yeah. i also never learned what money is I, I was calculating units yes but we never talked about what money is that's exact i mean i have a master's degree in accounting and that was like <laughs> yeah. to get out and then get into bitcoin yeah and then to discover austrian economics and finally actually before before austrian economics i will say the creature from jekyll island did address that topic mm. going into the nature of money but ultimately it's the austrians that really take it all the way home um, like on the origins of money by Carl Minger and that, you know, the fact that we live and breathe and spend almost all of our time pursuing money and we think through it, we think about it, we fight over it. Like it's a very pervasive part of our lives mm. yet. It's just not talked about yeah. in terms of like what it is that was in getting into Bitcoin, it's like, well, that's the first question. Right? Well, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is money. Okay, what is money? And like, oh shit, now we're in, now we're in <laughs> yeah, for them. And it's, uh, yeah, I wanted to make the show more of a invitation rather than a imposition, right? Yeah. Where a lot of people were trying to like orange pill and push Bitcoin on people. It's like, well, that doesn't work because again, you have to kind of meet people where they're at. But if you invite them to go on their own process, their own path of inquiry, then that's a, a better way to do it. Yeah. Another way to I wanted to go back to the gold and Bitcoin thing because perhaps another useful framing is if money is that thing that we're using to deal with uncertainty, like the reason you hold cash balances is so it's a rainy day fund, right? Like no matter what happens, what problems I confront, I have the widest set of options to address them when I hold just money because yeah. the money can... I can call anyone in the world to produce a thing or provide a service that will help me solve whatever the problem is. It makes to me like philosophical sense that the instrument we use to deal with uncertainty, you would want the maximal certainty in that instrument. Yes. Yeah. Right. It's kind of intuitive in a way. It's yeah. like, well, if I'm going to use this to deal with uncertainty. Well, to I want to create certainty towards an uncertain future. Yeah, it's a hedge against uncertainty, yeah, if you will. That's the same for everyone. You want the right? greatest certainty that yep. your hedge against uncertainty yes, will yes. operate. Yeah. And again, historically, gold was really good at that. You have this sort of predictable supply growth. It doesn't dilute you too quickly. Mm -hmm. And it's been used for 5,000 years, right? So a very strong social consensus. Yeah. But that pitch is really good. Which that is great. proposition is really good, yes. But again, looking at Bitcoin through that same lens, it's like you finally have perfect predictability in terms yeah. of the supply. You know exactly how much Bitcoin is issued, will ever be issued. You have perfect auditability of the the time chain, basically historically. You can't hide anything, right? The source code is open source, so nothing can be hidden inside of the monetary system. It's like, it's this, it's, this, it's not perfect information. There's this notion of perfect information in economics, but it's pretty damn close. I, and so it's I, the highest degree mm. of certainty, I think, of anything we've ever created. And that's what makes it such a useful yeah. money. I, I think two things there. I, I like what Safety Namus talks about, you know, that the, the, the future is uncertain for everyone because mm -hmm. you don't know how much time you have. So yeah. as you said, you want to create some, you want to have some sort of certainty towards this future. Yeah. And that is in essence, I would say that something that everyone wants because this condition is the same for everyone. This mm -hmm. uncertainty about the future is a condition that's the same for everyone. So creating some sort of certainty towards um, uh, the future is, is a, yeah, I would say a human... Universal, or, or, yeah. It's a universal yeah. uh, uh, want. I kind of lost my thought with the second thing, the yeah. second thing you said, but... Um, uh, just talking about how it's a, the ideal money is going to have the most certainty in it. 
as in yeah yeah so i would also say that bitcoin is you you didn't you said perfect i would say it's engineered truth so okay i, I heard i don't know who yeah. said that it's this not my uh, my term but uh-huh. so, someone uh, that i talked to said yeah. that and you mentioned the time chain this thing when you audit it by yourself when you verify it by yourself this is the truth of this system mm-hmm. it doesn't care about the rest of the world right yeah. bitcoin doesn't care but it's the truth of this system and if you want to have something that is truthful and remains the same towards this uncertain future mm-hmm. that would arguably be the best solution compared to any other yeah. solution or tool or asset however you want to call it right to create a certainty um, towards the future and i think it also makes it more clear for people to think about this question mm-hmm. of what do i want why do i save towards the future mm-hmm. what do i want to do in the future right Wh- whether it's building a family or a company or mm-hmm. some crazy building or yeah. you know what, whatever you would want to pursue but because the tool that everyone uses right now is so uncertain all the capital that you gather in this current moment is worth the most in the current moment yeah. so there is not really an incentive for you to because it's so uncertain right now to keep it towards the future because the uncertainty will actually increase that's right yeah 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 and so and you see the results of that right people are well you sell the currency and you buy land you go into real estate mm. You get something that can't be counterfeited so quickly, or stuff uh, that I don't want that yeah, doesn't have any. But ultimately, value. it's the people are just trying to scratch that itch of like, how do I like the guy you just mentioned? He just he made his money, mm. right? he made a lot of purchasing power and the selling of his business. He really just probably wants to maintain it at a low risk and maybe grow it slightly over time, not become less. Yeah, first ideally, yeah. yeah. And as I say, you're in the stay rich business, not the get rich business. Exactly. Right? Yeah. After, you've, after you've had your liquidity event or whatever it may be. Mm. Really just to stay would be, you should probably be satisfied with that. Yeah. But in a fiat paradigm, you can't just, stay, you can't just sit, you can't leave cash in the bank. You're going to get depreciated rapidly, right? With 30% over the past four years. Um, so you have to go into these higher risk investments like real estate, equities, et cetera. And that's, you're just creating more, you're, you're forcing, not forcing, inducing people to take more risk yes. than they otherwise would. Yeah. When re- in reality, all they want is sound money. But not in a conscious way. No, exactly. Yeah, right? they do, they're, just very, do, they're just yeah. following their, their yeah. survival instinct, yeah. basically. I think um, later when, so after only after I found Bitcoin, I realized that I always looked at uh, money as time. Yeah. So gather, mo- yeah. Mo- gathering money, gives you time and space to some degree, you know, depends on how much you have and what yeah. your spending is, etc. For you to figure out like, what am I here to do? What, what do I enjoy doing? What am I good at? What's my value? What's the value yeah. add that I, that I have um, in, this, in this world? But it's only true also getting Bitcoin uh, as a concept for being a tool to actually do that, that I realized this is the best tool for me to actually have have that time right and if you think about what are the what are the consequences about uh, uh from that so what i like for example you know we're in we're in the us right now i'm mm-hmm. coming from from europe what i like about the energy here is that everyone is building something there's a builder energy you know even yeah. though we talk about the money is flawed and all yeah. these things there's a builder energy and people are trying to to figure not only their life out but you know yeah, they're building, they're, they're trying businesses, mm-hmm. et cetera. And if you fail here, it's not that, it's not that bad because you have this builder energy. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like how America is construed to a, to a certain degree, I would say. I'm, I'm going to New York after there. Mm-hmm. It's even more, I mm-hmm, feel, right? For sure. But in Europe, this feeling is totally not there, right? This, when, when you fail, it's, it's a bad thing. You know, mm. it's it's not celebrated as it's celebrated here. Mm. But it's also because I think when the money is bad money and you take this risk and you fail at it and your money has depreciated over time, you are not you are not even able to give yourself more space to try something mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. But once you adopt Bitcoin, you basically it's it's kind of like how fiat money borrows energy from the future with yeah. bitcoin you kind of send energy 
mm. towards the mm-hmm. future. So let's say I try something for a year now and I fail, but I have all my wealth saved in Bitcoin. Mm. Then nothing really, really changed in the... Your wealth probably went up, actually. Probably, yeah. yeah. So it actually allows me to take this time to figure out, is this a thing that I could pursue? Mm-hmm. And if not, then I'm also kind of protected to try that try again. again. Yeah. But if I have fiat money and my and my wealth, uh, you know, diluted, uh, I don't know, 5%, 10%, yeah. maybe 15% effectively, I'm not really incentivized to try something like that again. So I feel like people are becoming more safe or yeah. more contained, you know, like they're not really pursuing what they are here to to do or to figure out yeah. what's what, and I, what they you know do. I would maybe even take it a step further that because money is being depreciated year over year your incentive is to borrow stronger dollars and pay back weaker dollars or whatever the local currency is so not only are people they're going to take these risks and if they fail they're less well healed <clears throat> to try again but yep. there's the possibility that they even took on a bunch of debt to try and take to take on the first enterprise that they're trying to build. And that's when you're gonna have total ruin, right? Mm-hmm. When someone actually gets over their skis on leverage, they can just get blown up and wiped out. And it's really hard to start over from zero. Uh, not many people can do it. And so the fact that fiat induces people to that maximal risk taking also seems like a bug, not a feature. Whereas in a Bitcoin world, you're, not, you're, you're less likely to borrow in Bitcoin terms, because you know you're paying back stronger Bitcoin over time, so you're going to be a little more conservative on your your debt accumulation. Yeah, I think it's also interesting to think about what does Bitcoin then actually produce, mm-hmm. right? And I think it's the certainty towards the future, the fact that there's a limitation, as you mentioned before, right? In the in the amount that means that all the energy stored in Bitcoin right now will never be diluted. It can actually only become more once more people adopt Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You know, the total amount of energy that's stored into Bitcoin will Mm -hmm. eventually also become more. But this constant is the thing that gives us or that lowers the uncertainty of the future. It's Mm -hmm. it's that every 10 minutes, these 20,000 nodes say, you know, this monetary policy Mm-hmm. It's still good. We can we can stick with this, and we don't have to wait for any press conference or any yeah. and any any people telling us what the Bitcoin is is actually worth. And I actually did an analysis last week because I heard uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, the mm-hmm. ECB um, president, uh, talk about you know one euro is one euro. You know, it's kind of like we say <laughs> one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. But she's she's lying. In 1999, one euro was one euro. Now that euro is 30 cents. Yeah. And what does one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin then actually mean? It means that that going from the one euro to the 30 cents will never, never happen. Yeah. And that is confirmed and uh, kept like that by computers and, and not people. Yeah. And I feel that that is the way for us to also, instead of having trust in other people that they will take care of us, right? The government will take care of us or they will, yeah. you know, do their uh, task as, uh, or the central banks will do their tasks, the tasks that they have, that you can actually start focusing on trusting yourself. Yes. More. Yeah. What is beautiful. Yeah. People need, yeah, we need people to trust themselves and not have the childlike mentality of, you know, someone's coming to save me or someone's mm. going to take care of that. Like, obviously we all need to outsource certain things, but they need to be done consensually. And there still needs to be an underlying uh, taking of responsibility. Yeah. Right. You can't just, what is, there's a Peterson quote. He says something like opportunity lurks wherever responsibility has been abdicated. Mm. And so opportunity, I mean, that could be a, good thing like you could build a solution to that where someone's like not taking responsibility for themselves but it's also vulnerable to opportunism mm-hmm. right and the central bank is definitely an opportunistic institution it's like oh if everyone just trusts us to manage this money supply and we dilute it slowly enough there are none the wiser yeah and in fact we can use some of the proceeds we steal to infect education to tell them it's good for them and before you know it it's this whole giant um misunderstanding right that, that people are now indoctrinated into believing that that they need this money and that the 
yeah, one Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. People get very confused on this. Yeah. It's like, what do you mean? That is such a tautology. You're not saying anything yeah, yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. One dollar is one dollar, one euro is one euro. I was like, no, actually, you yeah. are saying something. Yeah. Whatever Bitcoin you have, one Bitcoin, you know you have a guaranteed fraction of the total money supply possible. Yeah. One of 21 million, right? Yeah. You don't know that for dollars. You don't know that for euros. You don't even know that for gold, mm. right? You have an amount of money that represents the goods that are purchasable by it. But if that supply expands, the denominator expands, and the numerator stays the same, yeah. what you're holding in money, well, then your purchasing power goes down. Yeah. So then it's not the same, right? But so I, I think the same. this connected with, with what you said about this outsourcing of responsibility. These are two different kind of like dimensions that also tie into Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you mentioned before we recorded, like there's probably like 15 topics that you can mention that all touch Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. And that's also why I feel like it's just so, if eventually Bitcoin is very, very simplistic. It's just a thing that stays the same, right? There's a, it's a protocol, a monetary protocol that has rules. And the promise is that it stays the same and yeah. anyone can check every 10 minutes if it's still, if it's still like that. Yeah. If yes, you know, continue yes. using it. That's basically it. But because we live in this world where all these things about, well, money is abstracted, responsibility mm -hmm. is abstracted, right? Like what, what, what does that what does that mean? Yeah. And I feel like because people are, you know, like this, this idea of when you are young and you get your allowance, right? And eventually when you're 10 or 12, your parents get this letter from the bank, like, oh, you can start uh, a, a, ch a child account, mm -hmm. right? I talked to um, Ella Huff on my podcast mm -hmm. and she said, I remember that I was so happy when I could take my physical dollars and go to the bank and deposit, deposit them there. Now I realized that that was very stupid of me um, to do, but this is just what we learn and what we do. Yeah. And if you talk about this outsourcing your responsibility to people when you, when you talk about Bitcoin, I think this is one of the hardest things for people to agree upon that they yeah. are outsourcing their money, their yeah. energy, their time to yeah. other people that... Their sovereignty, ultimately. Yep. Yeah. You know, you're outsourcing that to people that do not care about you right. as as much as how you care about your own individual yes. life. And, you know, I wouldn't want to say that that's in a malicious way. It's just how that system works. Yeah. But that realization is not a nice realization. And I think it's a very big personal challenge for people to get over to, even before we can pitch this, you mm -hmm. know, value proposition mm -hmm. of, well, this is how Bitcoin could help you. It's that figuring out of what do I want? Well, I want to control my own life. I mm -hmm. want to have, you know, free choice or, or participate in a free market or, you know, just getting to these questions is already a pretty deep Take, take some digging yeah. for, for people to do, especially because we are just conditioned, well, to to bring our physical money to the bank, you know, yes. as children, and that's that's just it. And and the same is uh, I say this on my podcast a lot. Like if you grew up, especially as a millennial in the Western world, you grew yeah. up in the best time to ever grow up of anyone who yeah. ever lived. Yeah, and you got some coins or 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 a, or a bill, and you went to the candy store and you got a candy, and you were like, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, this is apparently how money works. There is no, you cannot compare it to anything. It's just what your parents tell you. This mm -hmm. is money. Okay. But your parents also don't understand. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah this conditioning that is unquestioned, latent cultural programming that you mm. just accept things at face value to use a monetary metaphor. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's necessary, right? In a way that we need to not, Every time we get in the car, we don't need to think about, oh, how does this ignition work? And how mm -hmm. does the mechanism work when I brake? Like, we yeah. need to make things unconscious, right? To, to automate certain things. But there's a danger that lurks there, too. If you automate something that's corrupt or bad or not in your best interest, well, then all of a sudden it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind problem, which I would say that's what the fiat currency complex is, especially in the West, right? Yeah. Well, like, it sort of works. It's always... The bank accounts are always there and the inflation. Yeah. I was told inflation is necessary for a healthy economy. Mm. So I think everything's working great. Well, it's, it's predatory on us, but it's even more predatory on the countries that are not part of, exactly. of the West, right? I mean, right. That, that's a whole nother yeah. topic, I would say, that uh, that 
that you can go into. But the fact that money is basically a representation of the finite energy that you expend in your finite time, mm -hmm. that's the same for everyone. The fact that that is corrupted, I would say is the biggest spiritual crime mm. that has been done to us. Because we, we talked about, okay, if this money is corrupted and it loses value each day and all the money that I have right now is worth the most right now, but my future is discount. Uh, you know, my I discount my future because everyone mm -hmm. discounts their future. Yeah, what what should I do? Well, the simple uh, solution is to outsource it to other people, and then I don't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. But what 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 does that mean? What risk are you taking when you do that? Yeah. Well, what is risk? Yeah, when people yeah. talk about that to me, I say like, well, everything is risk. Like life, waking <laughs> up is risk. Yeah, right. So it's it's I, I don't know if risk is the right yeah, term? Yeah, that's a good question. What is risk, right? But it's uh, what the probability that your outcome will diverge from your intention, something like that. So you do something, you intend for a thing to happen. There's always a certain probability that it won't happen. Uh, it, 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 yeah, I think the simplest for me uh, is um, I once had this psychedelic experience where I really went into death. Mm. And I kind of saw the world from a distance as like, you know, this giant bunch of ants for me, it was mm -hmm. ants. And I saw, you know, you know, when ants have this death walk, when mm -hmm. they walk in circles and they eventually die, like one falls off and they keep walking. Well, oh, I don't know about that. What, so what are they doing? They, they, they walk in circles yeah. and then some just die off, but they keep walking. I don't know. It's some, some, wow. I don't know if it's a ant psychosis or something, but my, my, the point where, where I went was like, okay, if I die, yeah, the, the, the people in, in my, um, circle, they're going to be sad, but in the grander scheme of things, yeah, my life doesn't really matter, right? Like the, my, my life is most valuable to myself and then to second, third degree, the yeah. people that are in my vicinity. And I thought, about life and how, you know, you being you is like a one in 300 trillion chance or something mm. like that. So if, if life is given to you and you think about, I've, I thought about dying, like you can always check out basically, mm -hmm. right? If you're like, oh, this is too heavy. Like I can always check <laughs> out. out. <laughs> but if there's only like a little thought that says, no, I don't want to die, then you have to take everything that comes with the life, all the risk yeah. that comes with the life. And that's kind of like how I drilled it down for myself is that if you wake up in the morning, what you want is to not die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, that, and, and, and you take the risk yeah. of dying by living. Yeah. And so when I think when we talk about risk, I like the definition that you said, mm -hmm. but it's also, yeah, it's kind of like what's, what is the impact on, or, or yeah, what's the, 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 the probability of me not getting what I want? Yeah. And the simplest explanation I have for myself is like, what's the probability? Like, how can I lower the probability that I died <laughs> today, yeah. basically? Yeah. And everything else regarding risk only comes after that. But if you talk about how do I build my life, what do I pursue and all these things, like that is like up there, I'd say with, not not dying eventually for sure yeah uh, the the maslow hierarchy of needs comes mm. to mind here where it's like yeah first don't die <laughs> yeah second breathe <laughs> yeah know, exactly third yeah. water or you know whatever they are yeah um yeah and then there's risk at every layer because mm. we don't control anything ultimately the farm at okifinoki is a revolutionary new regenerative agricultural community it features an 8,000 tree olive orchard, which they use to make their own olive oil, as well as a very large pecan orchard. All the animals on the farm are heritage animals with some varieties over 100 years old and others thousands of years old. Fresh eggs are produced daily by the farm's chickens. Also, there are over 1,000 beehives that pollinate the over 200 heirloom fruits and vegetables and provide honey to all the residents. The farm makes its own molasses, unrefined sugar, herbs, and spices. The farm also features an herbal apothecary and a commercial kitchen. These are just a few reasons why the farm is the healthiest place on earth. 
To learn more about The Healthiest Place on Earth, go to okefarm.com and use discount code BREEDLOVE for $21,000 off custom cabin pricing. Again, to learn more about the farm at Okefenokee, go to okefarm.com and be sure to tell them I sent you. Forget multivitamins and other supplements. Animal organs are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet. You can get 100 times more nutrients from organs than you can from muscle meats. But the problem with eating organs is that they are difficult to find in stores, they are difficult to prepare, and even when they are prepared well, they often don't taste great. Thankfully, Heart and Soil Supplements has made consuming organ meats so much easier by providing powderized organs in capsule form. Organ meats include everything your body needs to thrive. Vitamins, minerals, peptides, proteins, and growth factors. This is why organ meats were the most prized foods for our ancestors. Fortunately for us, Heart and Soil makes these treasured foods easily accessible. So go to heartandsoil.co today and use discount code BREEDLOVE to get started on your journey to optimal health and vitality. Again, that's heartandsoil.co, discount code BREEDLOVE. Have you ever wanted to start a business in the Bitcoin space? If so, then the Wolf Startup Accelerator could be for you. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to businesses developing in the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times each year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. Go to wolfnyc.com to learn more or apply today. Again, that's wolf, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. You use the term spiritual crime. Um, I'm in strong agreement that there is a spiritual crime occurring here, although I've never used that term before, so thank you for that. Um, but to people that are outside of this conversation, the Bitcoin money conversation, that sounds like a pretty outlandish, maybe sounds like an outlandish claim. Like, how are you connecting the world of commerce and finance to the <laughs> spiritual domain? So, like, mm. how do you approach that conversation and make those connections for, for people that may have not made them before? I feel like uh, life is a gift. So, yeah, as I just said, that once you realize that that is given to you, this mm. uh, physical experience of you, the, the, the spiritual being, right? So you, mm -hmm. you are a spiritual being having a, a physical experience. Then if you decide to not wanting to, to die, then you have to take everything that comes with life. And I think the biggest thing is what we talked about before is that uncertainty so, okay, I decide that I want, well, that I don't want to die. So I decide that I want to live. Mm -hmm. But everything that comes with that decision is very unclear. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, if you even wake up tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Or if the choice that you make right now in this moment will be the right choice. Mm -hmm. So participating in life is... I, th I think it's a game. It's a game of which the outcome you don't really know, mm. right? And if you agree that you are a spiritual being having a physical um, experience, then everything that draws you more to the physical than to the spiritual, mm. I'd say is a degradation of what you could experience. Mm. And when we talk about how fiat money, if it loses its value over time, makes you discount this life experience mm. for the future towards mm -hmm. the life experience even more. And you start consuming, in, and because your money is worth the most right now, you start consuming instead yeah. of building towards the future. I think that's, that's the distraction that I'm talking about, that you get drawn into... Mm. 
using the physical world or something like that. Yeah. I'm thinking through it while I'm talking, no, but no, I think no, it's no, something this like is, that. This is fantastic, actually. I'm, I'm connecting some dots here, too, because you said life is a gift. Mm. And the first thing that occurred to me, I was like, well, what's the opposite of a gift? Right? Something, something given. Well, the opposite of something given is something taken. Right? And so what we're saying about the money is that it's taking from you. Yes. Right? You hold it, yes. and you hold it for as purchasing power, but it's being taken from you. That's causing you to then discount your future more heavily. Mm. So you have less likelihood of achieving whatever goal you have in the future because you have had yes. energy taken from mm. you. That's drawing you out of a relationship with your future self and into a relationship more with your present physical yeah. self. Like we're being shifted from a mentality of future planning, future consideration, lower time preference, mm. as we say in Bitcoin, into this higher time preference more immediate, physically concerned, barbaric individual, even if you take it to its extreme, right? Yeah. If you're just like the guy, it's like, how do I eat now? Yes, but it's not the living in the now. People could conflate that. Yeah, right? that's they could true. Say that's like, true. That's you know, true. Robert is talking about living in the now. That's now. true. It's, it's, I don't think that's yeah. what we are talking that, about. No, it's, no, yeah, yeah, because, well, you need to have rational foresight into mm -hmm. what you're doing in life, right? Yes. The, the more you think about the implications of your present actions on the future, mm -hmm. the better off you and th those around you are. Yes. But that doesn't mean... But that's being aware of it. Yes. So you are consciously making choices right now. Yes. I think that is living in the now. Yes. Towards this path in the future versus if that future is discounted even more, how conscious are the choices right now that, exactly. that you are making? Yeah. So I think that's what we talk about when you talk about, you know, that's the corruption yeah. of maybe that's the consciousness, I don't know, or the consciousness ex aspect uh, of being conscious in this moment. Yeah. The fact that you are not able to take time, because I think it takes time to sit and reflect. Yeah, contemplation and, 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 is a luxury. And, and exactly. Yeah. Well, if you don't have that time and you don't have that luxury, yeah. then y you will be drawn further away, I think, from 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 the spiritual challenge that everyone has in yeah. a set, or challenge, maybe, I don't know if it's challenge or oppor let's say opportunity, yeah. you know, the opportunity you can give yourself to explore that part of, of the experience that you have. Yeah, yeah, so to have this long view and contemplation, but then when you're taking action, you're right, you do want to be mindful, living in the moment, mm. you know, like doing a thing, but thinking about something else, that's yeah. not useful. Yeah. But you also don't want to just act all the time either without thinking, Yeah. right? So there's this balance, right? You need the leisure of contemplation to decide, you know, what your values are and how you're going to chart your life towards establishing those values for yourself. But then when it comes time to act, you, you have to let go of the contemplative side of yourself and just t be mindful, right? Be fully engaged yeah, in yeah. the action. But the dilution of the money is uh, mitigating our ability to engage in that contemplate that contemplative part. Yeah. So it's kind of forcing people to just be, and maybe that's the builder energy you were talking about here in the U.S. It's like people are just literally just trying to outrun inflation. Yeah. <laughs> literally just like, oh, we'll do anything yeah. to not... And it's also possible, right? Because yeah. there's enough people to build. Uh, you know, um, last time when I was in New York, I talked to a guy who had a business that I wanted to do in Europe. And I asked him, you know, like, would you, I love this idea. I had the same idea. Like, would you mind? And he said, you know, I'm in the New York metropolitan area. Area There's 20 million people. I can build a billion dollar business here. Like, I don't, I don't really care if you do the same in, in Europe. So you can also, you, you have the opportunity to also keep running here. And I think that's also... Uh, a distraction from the the real problem. The fact that you can still keep running, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, also doesn't really force you to have this reflective moment per se to yeah. to think about like what what am I actually um, doing? Yeah, here? yeah. Is this what I want to do? Is this the value that I want to? Yeah. So like know? again, you being <laughs> from Europe, you, there, there might be this appreciation for the the hustle culture or the builder energy. I think as you called it. And I would tend to agree, actually, like if I have to pick something about American culture that I like, it's mm -hmm. that, well, people do like to make change, right? They try to go and start businesses. There's this mentality of if if you don't like a situation, then we can go and do something about it. Yep. And I appreciate that, but it can come at a cost. If mm -hmm. you're just doing that and not 
doing the step back and the contemplation, then, um, you know, we see kind of like a degradation in cultural values too, right? Where people are just on the paper chase or, you know, whatever the thing is like, well, then that lead, that's a dark path too. It's like, you can't just make money for money's sake. Cause then you'll just do anything regardless of the ethical, moral implications, mm-hmm. even the entrepreneurial implications, right? It may not even be a productive enterprise. You just be engaged in organized crime or whatever the thing is just for the sake of making money. Yeah. And so that seems to be a little more, I mean, that's everywhere, but it's a little, the, the criminal element feels a little stronger in the US too. I well, may be wrong uh, about that. But. Well, if you believe that the consciousness is shared, that we, you know, we, you, you are this spiritual being who has the, the physical experience, but the consciousness comes from a shared mm-hmm. uh, place. Then although we might have this conversation and trying to add something to, to that, firstly, perhaps for ourselves and then for more of a collective, mm-hmm. if the people that share the consciousness with us are uh, engaging in the activities that you just mentioned, that will uh, deduct from uh, all our efforts again, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's why I think eventually having a harder money and, you know, once people understand that they are sharing their finite energy in time or, or trading their finite energy in time for a reward that's infinitely created and realize that that's the stupidest trade that mm-hmm. they could ever make. And they realize that what they want is a reward that they can use to store this monetary energy towards the future yeah. to decrease the uncertainty of the future, yeah. as we just talked about. And then I think there will come a time where people will start pricing the value that they bring both in Bitcoin and in, and in fiat money and slowly adopt the better money, right? That's, yeah. uh, I think that's Gresham's law. Yeah. If I'm not, if yeah, I'm correct. yeah. To earn that for spending their energy in, in time. And we slowly get to a place where, you know, if you have five contractors and one of them asks Bitcoin and the rest asks fiat money, you already know that this Bitcoin guy has a certain set of values or look towards yeah. his the value right. that that he's bringing. Other way around, I would say it's probably the same if you would offer Bitcoin for mm-hmm. for a job. Mm-hmm. Then the people re, uh, reacting to that also, um, yeah, share values to to a certain degree. But I think once once we get there, it will force people to think. What am I actually here to do? What is the value that I'm bringing? Mm. Am I doing what I Mm -hmm. want to be doing? You know, like you said, if everyone is running to catch up with Mm -hmm. inflation and you're doing that not in a conscious way, then, and I do think this is a hard realization eventually, you know, if probably a lot of people will realize, damn, I'm I'm spending my my finite time and Mm -hmm. energy on something that I really don't like doing. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot, you know, like I talk a lot about the millennials like on, on TikTok or, or Instagram when people say like, oh, I have two degrees, but I'm rolling sushi at some <laughs> sushi place because I cannot get a job. I don't like my life. You know, uh, I am very uncertain about the future, like all these things. You know, it's, of course, it's not a nice realization, but if we can get to a point where we have more, uh, a better money, a fair money that is a fair reward for the finite time and energy, then we will force people, but in a natural way, I think, to really mm-hmm. take this time yeah. to contemplate, okay, I'm here, nobody's going to save me. You know, this is all not, not n- these are not nice realizations, yeah. but I believe for the spiritual journey, yeah. you have to get to the point you where... You get in touch w- with reality. Yeah. yeah. But also realize that you cannot really do anything yeah. about it in a sense. You can only accept it, mm-hmm. right? If you push it away, it gets stronger. Mm-hmm. Or if you grab something, mm-hmm. you know, it'll it'll slip away. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the spiritual stepping stone, mm-hmm. I would say. Once you realize that you can just accept mm-hmm. what life brings you because you decided this morning that you don't want to die. Yeah. That, at least in my journey, that that was for me the, a big stepping stone. Yeah. yeah. No, it's it's fantastic. And the idea of giving people more time, right? It's, it's pretty radical because that's what I think you almost everyone comes to this point 
at some point in life, like regardless of your financial position, that time is the most valuable mm. thing because of, as you've said, right, we're all mortal. You never know when the end is coming. And so the ability to have more time to spend as you see fit becomes this thing of preeminent value for everyone, whether you're blue collar, white collar, super yeah. rich, ever, any, anywhere in between. And that's what Bitcoin is doing basically, right? No matter what, if it's your business or you, you're just able to hold the fruits of your labor in something that is independent of others wishes basically yeah. like you get to decide yes <laughs> right you, you you rendered some useful favors to people over time and you mm -hmm. earned savings and now you get to decide what to do with that not someone else yeah well it's it's like that right now right like any venture any job is taking risk because you make a choice at a certain moment to spend your time and energy on you know whatever mm -hmm. you do i think i think that's really good that you say that like it's not about the role that you have if you like landscaping and you're a good landscaper or you know what it doesn't it doesn't matter what you do but if you have a venture or you pick a job or you do a job that is taking risk and if your reward is something that's devalued over time programmatically you know the Keynesians think that two percent a year uh, uh, stimulates uh, spending the mm -hmm. money well I don't think we know the real number, but the real number is not mm -hmm. <laughs> what is reported at least. Mm -hmm. When you come home from that job or that venture, you have to take more risk to mitigate this devaluation yeah. of the reward that you gather yeah. during the day. Yeah. Instead of spending time with your family, instead of thinking yes. about ways to be better at your job or your venture or planning for the future or whatever. That's why people are forced to become investors and the entire idea of saving just accumulating units of a currency yeah. over time in a safe way and not doing anything because you want to spend your time with your family or honing your craft or whatever. So not taking more risk. I think that is eventually where everyone would, everyone would agree that they would want to do that. Like, why would you yeah. want to come home at 7 p.m., uh, have a dinner, and then in the evening you're trying to battle <laughs> Wall Street traders in yeah, the stock yeah. market or yeah. something? Like, what, what is that about? Yeah, no, it's, yeah, again, saving you time, right? That, yeah, or no, it's, yeah, but eventually it's it will it's, give you time. So also, yeah, yeah, will give you time. Yeah, it's letting you save the time you've already accumulated through work. Yes. But then also yes. preventing you from spending time defending yeah. that accumulated savings by trading against yeah. Wall Street trading bots and all this. Yeah, and there's several examples of yeah. how Bitcoin flips everything off fiat money. So yeah. when you take debt in fiat money, you borrow time from the future. Yeah. Or energy, if you take energy from yeah. the future to the now, yeah. to spend it on whatever. Yeah, you know, at a I cost. Think, I think Americans work almost one and a half days per week to help their government, to pay tax on the reward for that work, to help their government pay interest on the debt yeah. that they spend on something that these people probably didn't even profit from or, sure. or got any value of course from. Not. No. So you're literally sharing or like giving away let's say 12 hours <laughs> per week of a 30-hour yeah. work week to do that. Yeah. And that, yeah, it's it's just so dilutive yeah. of, of everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think the framing of time, I mean, that's, again, universally appealing to people, right? No one, it, it just lets us go back to grandma's wisdom of just <laughs> Probably, earn yeah. more than you spend and save. Yeah. But savings just hasn't worked for a long, mm. long, long time. Bitcoin just makes it work again. Yeah, and so it's like it's, it's complicated and all these things. We can go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and talk about all these different aspects on it. But the reality is, it's just very it's just sound money. It should just be that. It should yeah. be that you can save. That's also how I see Bitcoin. So I'm not investing in Bitcoin. No, I'm not buying saving. Bitcoin. I'm yeah. just moving economic energy that I gathered in in well, yes, still the fiat world, but I'm moving it to an asset that you know makes me sleep at yes. night knowing. That is just secured yeah. in in the right way. I think you had a, a good example. There was a clip where you said, uh, you know, the M two money supply in the in the U S. Um, like yeah. how much was created yeah. and how how much how many lifetimes that uh, yeah, well, corresponded to. Yeah, I was just telling you <coughs> offline. We actually just recorded the global version of that. Mm. So I had recorded that with I think Peter McCormick a year or so ago and we just looked at the us m2 and what that equated 
the counterfeiting of that currency, how much that equated in terms of human lives, yeah. the, the labor energy of human lives stolen. And we, we just recorded the global one and it was, it's staggering. It's February, 2024, global M2 is a hundred trillion dollars. I'm sorry, February, 2020. Global M2 is a hundred trillion dollars. February, 2024, four years later, it's $130 trillion. So Global M2, broad money, had expanded 30% in four years. The average annual wage rate globally at that time was $10,000 per year. So that, if you divide $30 trillion by 10,000, you get 3 billion human years yeah. worth of labor energy stolen through the counterfeiting of currency, like the yeah. push of a button, basically. Yeah. And then 50, assuming 50 years of working life per person that equals 60 million human lives worth of labor energy stolen through the counterfeiting of 30 trillion dollars in currency between the years 2020 and 2024 so it's like you gotta sit with that math for a minute and just yeah. let it sink into your bones yeah. and it's a staggering number 60 million people there's 330 million people in the u.s so that's all the productive output and the working uh Workforce is less than that, right? The workforce is probably mm. half of that. So call it 200 million people. So one out of every three people in the U.S., all their productive output for 50 years was literally stolen at the press of a button through the counterfeiting of currency. And it's like to argue that that's not a problem or that's somehow mm. good for us. Like, are you fucking well, kidding me? Well, some people say that, right? They 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 think it's that that printing money is a good way. But if you put these numbers on the actual output. Is is that there, right? I think approaching yeah. this for more for more people, also us when we are talking about it, it should be in a in a very very rational, very simple way. So you said this amount of people, and we should ask people the question: Do you think that we see that output mm -hmm. in the world? Is is there a product of this no, productivity? No. Is it's, is that there? It's a sh because again, and this is. Maybe it's this nominal, this this failure to understand. It's looking at money at face value, right? When people mm -hmm. think, oh, you printed money, so we have more money. It's like, no, no, no. Money is a representation of goods. Yes. If you just increase the money supply and don't increase the goods, well, then the money buys less goods, right? You've increased the denominator, yeah. not the numerator. Mm. And so you're just shifting goods from one hand to other hands. So it's actually, not only does it not increase productivity, it decreases productivity yep. because the people that were prudent and worked and saved are now penalized. They didn't get to keep all of the fruits of their labor. So why would they go out and produce more? Yeah. So well, human productivity is going to go down yeah, yeah, as yeah. a result of that. Well, that's what breaks these incentives, right? Yeah. If I'm a positive person and I want to contribute and I know what my craft is, then this third party that I used to trust or trust, mm -hmm. learned to trust, mm -hmm. actually devalues all these things that i that i have that are my are my character right that yeah. that motivate me to to produce what i what i also love as an example is if you look at the nasdaq in uh, dollar terms yeah it's like just under all-time high or something right like it's yeah. really really high yeah, yeah if you denominate nasdaq so tech stocks yeah in m2 yeah it's all-time well it's not all-time low but it's lower than the top of the dot-com bubble yes right. when i saw that yeah. that's mind-blowing yeah. because no one can argue right against the fact that the technology now is yes. way better than in exactly than 24 years ago yeah right and i think that's a good example of how broken the money is because yeah. it fights against the the deflationary yeah. nature of progression through technology do you want to give your kids a foundation of freedom and understanding of bitcoin and a healthy skepticism of government then you should try Tuttle twins it's a cartoon about a grandma with a time-traveling wheelchair who takes her grandkids on hilarious adventures to learn about economics and freedom. Think the education of Magic School Bus meets the comedy of The Simpsons. With Tuttle Twins, your kids can learn about Bitcoin from Satoshi Nakamoto, civil disobedience from Harriet Tubman, natural rights from John Locke, and how to destroy the economy from Karl Marx. Today, Hollywood greenlights a lot of woke content or mindless garbage. Each episode of Tuttle Twins is parent-funded, parent-vetted, and only released when it's parent-approved. Because Tuttle Twins is fan-funded, it was the world's first kids' show to teach about Bitcoin. 
That episode alone has been seen over 40 million times and was tweeted about by Michael Saylor. You can watch episodes of Tuttle Twins for free right now. And if you like what you see, you can use code BREEDLOVE for 10% off a subscription to the Angel Studios app and watch all of the episodes. So go to angel.com slash breedlove to discover Tuttle Twins today. And remember to use code BREEDLOVE for 10% off. One of my highest health priorities is keeping my brain in top shape. To take care of my brain power, I do many things, such as striving to read, write, exercise, and meditate daily. One of the latest tools in my brain power toolkit is MindLab Pro. MindLab Pro is a nootropic supplement that is scientifically proven to enhance your brain power. When I take MindLab Pro, my mind feels like it has a better grip on the world, my thinking is more lucid, and the articulation of my speech is radically improved. MindLab Pro has been tested in rigorous, double-blind, placebo-controlled human trials and has been proven to enhance brain power for users in every age group. MindLab Pro is an advanced formulation of 11 nootropic ingredients and is backed by research from over 1,400 human trials conducted over the past 32 years. So if you're looking to enhance your brain power, MindLab Pro is an excellent solution. Go to mindlabpro.com slash breedlove to start enhancing your brain power today. Again, that's mindlabpro.com slash breedlove. Kalshi is the first legal prediction market in which you can bet on the outcome of any future event that you're interested in, such as the U.S. presidential election, inflation rates, or when the next version of ChatGBT will be released. Let's say you think Trump will win the U.S. presidential election, and let's say the market is pricing his odds of winning at 50%. So you can then buy 100 shares of a Trump victory at 50 cents each, so that would be $50 for 100 shares. And if you're right, you will get $100 back and double your money. But you could also sell early. If Trump's odds of winning went up to, say, 70%, you could sell for 70 cents each and lock in a $20 profit. And even if you don't want to trade, you can go and just watch the live odds to see who is more likely to win the race. And Kalshi has hundreds of markets just like this for you to go and play in. So go to kalshi.com slash breedlove today to start playing in this predictions market. The first 500 traders who deposit $50 will get a free $20 credit. Again, that is kalshi.com, K-A-L-S-H-I.com slash breed love another one of these crazy things that's so intuitively true is that of course prices are supposed to go down that's we're solving problems better yes. faster cheaper yes. over yes. time yes. right the, whatever we want if yeah. we want more of it we would want the price of it to go yeah. down so yeah. we could buy more of it i use the bread example a lot why do, why do we think it's funny that the bread used to be 20 cents and it's four dollars why is that funny people laugh about that <sighs> Yeah, but know. but imagine how far away we are from where we where we could be if the bread yeah. was already twenty five cents fifty years ago. Yeah, nutritionally probably better than the bread we have now. Uh -huh. You can rationally argue that we have become better at producing bread yes. in fifty or sixty years. That would be weird if if, if, if we, we wouldn't have. Yeah. But now it's but the price has we've gotten worse. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've gotten like five X worse. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that's okay. Like, you know, people say that deflation uh, deflation is bad, but they never finish the sentence, right? They de they never say deflation is bad in a debt based economy. Yeah. So they only yeah. use the first part. They say no, it's very bad because that disincentivizes people to yeah. to produce. The but Ke the Keynesian trope. Yeah. yeah, but I think the Austrians argue that it would actually increase the competition eventually. Yeah, well, I mean, again, it's I, it's such a linguistic thing because I think it's even yeah. we're almost impotent to make the argument with most people, let's say the masses, when we're using the euphemisms of inflation and deflation, right? It's just, it's either <clears throat> money is appreciating or money is depreciating, basically. Your money is appreciating under deflation and your money is depreciating under inflation, the, the the euphemism is an inversion almost right mm -hmm. it's at your you are when your money is depreciating your purchasing power is deflating right but as a result prices are going up and we call it inflation but we shouldn't call it inflation we should call it 
uh, purchasing power depreciation, basically. I like the example of eggs because you brought up bread, but, you know, bread and other things, people sort of argue like, oh, we increased crop yields and we did all these little things and whatever, whatever. Yeah. Uh, still not no good arguments for why the price increased, but they argue that, oh, this bread's different than that yeah, bread, yeah, so yeah. the price went up and whatever. Hedonic adjustments and all this bullshit. But if you just look at eggs, it's like, we didn't re-engineer that chicken to do anything. That chicken's just laying eggs. Like, we didn't make them lay eggs faster. I mean, maybe they pump them full of hormones or whatever, but how did the price of eggs go from, yeah. you know, a, whatever it was, $2 a dozen four years ago to $12 a dozen today? Or, you know, maybe I'm off a little bit, but mm. it's, it's, it's double, triple, quadruple the price. Did we did the are the chickens laying eggs more slowly? Like yeah, what yeah, happened? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I I got to this insight from a podcast I listened of Aubrey Marcus with mm. uh, Nate Hagens, and mm. they talked about energy. It was totally not Bitcoin related, but uh, Nate Hagens said, you know, if you look around you, also when people listen to this, if you look around mm -hmm. you, anything you see um, uses uh, energy was used to create or maintain anything you see around Absolutely. you in the room, right? And yeah, like does it cost the chicken more energy to make? <laughs> an egg does does a tree need more sunlight to create the same apple and the answer is just no and it's it's i hope we can find more examples to show people that it's yeah. the thing that we price it in yes that is exactly. actually the problem and not you know the sun or the chicken yeah you're basically <laughs> left with no option at that point yeah. other than to accept mm. that the reality is the chicken's output of eggs has not changed, but the price says its out its ability to mm -hmm. output eggs has gone down seventy five percent. What's lying to me here? Well, people that will say then there's bigger chicken farms and etc. No, but bullshit. then no, it's but that is no that should argue <laughs> you should then argue that you became more productive. Yeah. So the price should um, uh, go down, you know. And I think you know the bread example again. Like I I just think like why is the bread not free? Why are there people yes. that are still hungry how yeah. how is that even how is that even possible it's the lack of consensual exchange it's the theft we have built into the <clears> system that's that's driving poverty still and so yeah. what i mean obviously we're dancing around the point here of broken incentives breaking mm. there being so many downstream consequences of having let's call it mal incentives i guess uh through the the fiat currency system where you know, it's a heads I win, tells you lose situation, yeah. right? Wall Street, central banks, uh, political elite, those close to the money printer can benefit and they can sow all these seeds of, of uh, economic disruption, right? Through malinvestment, all of these things. And then once it blows up, they actually don't incur any of that damage. So it's, it's privatizing profits and socializing losses, yeah. as I think Naval called it. What are the broader social implications of broken incentives? Like it, this seems to be a thing we really get into in Bitcoin. It's like, and something maybe Bitcoiners all agree on, incentives really matter a lot. Mm. As in it sculpts who we are, sculpts our character, sculpts our minds, sculpts our paths of action, like what we do each and every day. Um, and if you have incentives that are tilting us towards bad activity however you would define that well yeah. you're going to see more of that and bitcoiners like to believe that it it tilts us toward more productive activity more uh peaceful collaborative activities so what are the how do you get into the broader social implications of incentives yeah i think what what you describe is what i call the the it's the zero sum fiat money game yeah yeah the i win i win you lose mentality yes. That's also why Bitcoin is so hard to to grok because yeah. it's positive it, sum. Yeah, well, it's a mutually beneficial game. Mm -hmm. You know, I I can trust the rules because, well, I'm incentivized to trust the monetary rules of Bitcoin mm -hmm. because you are incentivized to trust yes. the monetary rules of Bitcoin, and I don't have to trust that. Right, you will follow the rules because you can only benefit from using Bitcoin. Yeah. Not the price appreciation, but the store value, for example. You know, trust you can... individual self-interest versus trusting the individual. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. if I'm incentivized to follow the rules, and that is clear, it, and it is clear to me that you are also incentivized to follow the rules, mm -hmm. then you know that's why we are trying to tell everyone yes. about Bitcoin. Yes. Eventually. Yes. Um, 
the 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 broader implications i think <clears throat> sorry um it kind of goes back to what we talked about before i think before you see bitcoin you have to see this broken yeah. money but oh, wow, yeah. because it's not a good realization that everything you thought you knew about money which is basically nothing hence you know this podcast <laughs> That is why people have these arguments that are like, but what if, you know, Sato you know, Jamie Dimon says, what if Satoshi comes back and it becomes 42 million or this? Like just that Does, way of thinking yeah. is instilled yeah. in us. Yeah. It's instilled yeah, he still in thinks us. it's a centralized project. I, I don't, I, I, yeah, or maybe he's trolling. I, I really don't understand yeah. why anyone in, in, in a role like that would still dismiss. He's talking his book. It. He's talking his book. I know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, that just... it, yeah. It should be a signal. Again, I think, you know, I think yes. what we are talking about is, you know, being curious, yeah. trying to be rational. Yeah. And when you see someone talk like that and you think like, oh, he, he must know what he's talking about. So, you know, <laughs> it is the guy on the TV says, so yeah. I, I should, yeah. you know, believe that, you know, that should be a really big signal for you that you're not thinking for yourself, you know. And that's also when people call Bitcoin a cult, I yeah. say like, well, Bitcoin is the only cult <laughs> that invites you to think for yourself and don't trust anyone else yes. because you don't have to yeah. trust anyone else. That's the entire point. The entire point is that, <clears throat> and I got this from, I once listened to Rogan, I don't know, the, the guest, and they talked to a clip from, I think it was Madeleine Albright, and they talked about the first Iraq war, I think, uh, is that her time? I, I think it was that one, where she got asked the question, do you think that the death of, 500,000 children or something was justified. Uh, uh. And she said, well, according to the calculations, you know, uh, you know, that was justified. It's horrible. Horrible. And Rogan and the guest, they talk about this, like, how can you sleep at night, etc. Uh. But then they talk about, well, we are judging this, but it's very easy to judge when you are not in that position, right? Uh. So it's really easy to say, I'm on the moral high ground. I'm the better person. If I was in that job, I would never uh -huh. allow that, uh. right? And that made me realize that, you know, as you said, the people closer to them, to the money spigot, yeah. you know, the, they profit from it because they can. Sure. We both have children. You see in a young child, you see the egotistical nature of, yeah. of people, right? Yeah. Like, and, and also yeah. now, like, I would rather for you to die than, than me of to course. die, right? Like that yeah. is in, in everyone. So yeah. we are in that sense, uh, co corruptible. If we are put in a situation where we can corrupt a system to benefit our own individual yes. lives, then we would probably do that. Yes. Also not a nice realization, I think. Yes. But once you're honest about that, uh, and I know some people don't don't agree, but this is what I got from from that that Rogan discussion. Like once you're honest about that, yes, I would probably be corrupt and benefit myself and my yeah. family and all these things. The other side of that is okay, but if everyone is like that, and you are probably being played by mm -hmm. people that you know compose, uh, that that are a third party that have control over your individual life, but they don't care about it. Once you get to that point, you can realize that if we have a money where no one has to trust any other person, yeah. that we can kind of solve this human corruptibility. Yeah. And there will still be people that will try to game mm -hmm. the Bitcoin system and all these things. You know, I think people talked a lot about that. But the incentive is higher to just follow it yeah. than to try to, to game it. Yeah. And I think that's another interesting aspect of how Bitcoin fixes yes. our human, some, some of our human flaws. <laughs> but I think this is the biggest, the, the biggest one. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic point that it's much more profitable... <laughs> to follow the rules in Bitcoin than it is to try to break them. It actually penalizes you yeah. financially for trying to break them yeah. and it rewards you for following them. And so you get this, yeah, this, this, the, what is the game we've been trying to play between humans is how do we establish a rule set that is fixed and permanent and evenly applied, right? All players follow the same rules there's not different rules applied to different groups of people. Yeah. That I would argue is the essence of corruption itself, right? If we are playing basketball, 
but you put a gun to my head and say, well, my shots count as four points and yours <laughs> yeah. count as two. I'd be like, well, yeah. fuck, this game's fucking corrupt. And anyone yeah. watching it would also think the same thing. Like, and that just, would be pretty clear, by the way, right? The gun to clear. the head is very clear. It's pretty clear. But yeah. that's what statism is. That's yeah. what central banking is. Yeah. It's like rules for thee, not for me, mm -hmm. right? Two different sets of rules yeah. apply to two and different And I got groups. this from you, I think. The rules versus rulers. That's this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so to have a rule set that can't be changed that serves the interest of the individual users that's what we've been going for right mm -hmm. an unalterable set of fair rules for everyone to play by this is the yeah. essence of uh you know innocent until proven guilty english common law <laughs> habeas corpus which is the same thing all of the you know even the u.s constitution the the equality in the eyes of the law mm. all of these things are basically trying to get to that yeah, right yeah. how do we but get it's to all that? on paper all on paper yeah. and yeah. all yeah. can be ignored exactly. and you know yes. twisted by yeah. rhetoricians yeah. and yeah. all this stuff but bitcoin can't yeah and but that's what creates the corruption right it's written on paper yes and it you can calls it. upon your morality or something right. to to keep following that and that's also the people that and the interpretation they also, can they can yeah, twist yeah, the interpretation yes, yes. or what did this mean what that, yeah. but like bitcoin like it's yeah. not subject to interpretation mm -hmm. it just is what it is yeah but that's also it, what serves the Bitcoin system. Yes. Right. So the that's the incorruptibility. Right. Yes, it's this yeah, universally yeah. applied rule set, and yeah. the the just but sorry, for also the, for the survivability of the system, it is important that people exactly, follow the rules. Exactly, because back to the basketball game, if you put the gun to my head and say my shots count as four, yours count as two, no one's gonna watch that game. No one's gonna play that game. That game's gonna degenerate and go mm -hmm. away. Right. You ruined the game. And so by taking the possibility of using coercion to change the rules out of the system, right? Because you can't, there's no gun to point at Bitcoin mm -hmm. to cause it to be 42 million or anything else. People no longer fight over the rulemaking authority. Yes. They just follow the rules. Yeah. And that I think is basically what geopolitical strife is. Right, you have 200 some odd nation states. What is a superpower? The superpower is the one that makes the rules for everyone else. <laughs> yes. But yeah. if all of a sudden they can't make mm. this one, I mean, it's not, not like it solves everything. There's still going to be people fighting over the rule of law and all these other things, but you're taking money out of yes. the equation in so that game. So it's way more on merit and exactly. actually walking your talk. Like you're not able to only talk anymore. You have to walk the talk. And yes. I think this is a nice leeway back to the game aspect yes if the rules of the game let's call it the game of life because in life we exchange value constantly mm -hmm. with each other because i don't have everything <clears throat> you want and you don't have everything i mm -hmm. want or need mm -hmm. to create whatever the life is that i want so if the rules of this game um are more fair we can actually play the game more fair but yes this is a pretty utopian thought I think if you, you know, because the contrast with the current game that we are forcibly in, I would say, uh -huh. not only because we were born, but because we are forced to use yeah. a money that we don't uh, control. I think that should show you how big the war is, basically, yeah. the spiritual war, yes. eventually. Yeah. So this is a very high level. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I don't know why I use the word war. Uh, I talked to Tour de Maester. He said, I'm going to use war more. <laughs> but it's a, it is a spiritual yeah. war. Because as we talked about before, if there are people that can corrupt your spirit, yes, that is not okay. Yes, It's really not okay. No, it, it's the, the line between good and evil <clears throat> cuts down the heart of every individual. Yeah. And I think, the, I think, speaking on behalf of Bitcoiners, if I may be so presumptuous, a point of agreement among Bitcoiners is that incentives really affect the oscillation of that line, right? Mm. If we are incentivized to act good, well, then we'll the line will be more good and less evil. And if we're incentivized to act evil or to steal from one another, then we'll do yeah. more of that. We'll basically do whatever is profitable. And so, what this is where you get to that spiritual part, because like, what are the implications for the human being, their path of moral and character development over time, even intergenerationally? as a result of interacting with an incorruptible rule set. Yeah. Right, we're finally playing a game that, that is not subject to our own corruption. Is there feedback into the human soul, basically? And so system of perfect integrity, 
encouraging people of more perfect integrity to mm. to develop and succeed in the world. And then to me, it's not surprising that you see people like Jamie Dimon of utter disintegrity saying, oh, this thing is, you know, what if Satoshi comes back and there's 42 million, right? Mm. This is just like the candle maker decrying the, the light bulb maker. You know, he's just talking <laughs> totally. his own book. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I'm scared that this yeah. thing's going to take eat my lunch. And then he starts using rhetoric and being disingenuous yeah. to try and call this thing down. I do think if you would ask him, I'm not sure if it's so conscious as, as you say. Maybe right? not. I mean, I, I think he, he's got to at least know it's a threat. Yeah, okay. If he doesn't know that, then yeah. So then once I, I he, think, once he uh, sees it as a threat. In, in certain, yeah, he, uh, and, and you're, of, you're playing at that level, you'll say and do anything. to like he, Of eth- course, but he, and, he's part of a system that he has to maintain. And I think what you said for, you know, introducing Bitcoin in this game of life, you said feedback. I, I like that idea. I like that the feedback is more honest. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. If you suck at what you do yes. and nobody wants to give you the hardest money to ever exist. Yeah. That's, again, not a nice realization, but it's very good because if you suck at making cakes... That's you know, an incentive you, you, you to get better. Exactly. Yeah. But if Jamie Dimon's incentive, subconsciously, mm. also is to uh, maintain or protect the system that he is part of... Of course. He might be saying all these things on TV in a conscious way, mm-hmm. but he's... He's accumulating behind the scenes. Uh, probably, yeah. but well, <laughs> sorry, that that was that distracted me from yeah. the thought. But what I wanted sorry. to say was no, no worries. Um, if he's not aware of the fact that his incentives are corrupted, that what he's doing doesn't help the society as mm-hmm. a whole, it helps him as an individual, mm-hmm. but not the society as a whole. If he doesn't realize that, then you can also not. I don't want to say blame him for that, but if he's a victim of the broken incentives, yeah, you know, then yeah, yeah that that yeah, it maybe that's just what it is. That's also why it's so important to view Bitcoin as this parallel, mm-hmm. parallel system. Like it doesn't really matter what Jamie Dimon thinks of it because this thing is unstoppable anyway. So it's, I, I agree, know. I agree with that completely. And then I, yeah, I think blame in general is pretty useless. Yeah, like even if you attribute response like maybe inside of an organization if you're trying to like not have someone repeat a problem it's like well who caused this problem like don't let them be in charge of that thing no, again it's futile but it's blame futile. where you're just trying to like dump the vitriol mm. on someone is, is in general kind of useless my only point with the jamie diamond was like it's not surprising to me to see someone so disingenuous about what bitcoin is you mm-hmm. know when he says when he says, what if Satoshi comes back and turns it into 42 million? That's a nonsense If you know argument. the first thing about Bitcoin, you yeah. know that's not possible. Yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah, that's yeah. not how Bitcoin works, yeah. right? So he's saying, you mm-hmm. know, well, what if up is down, basically? You know, he's saying something completely ludicrous to try and spook people that don't understand mm-hmm. Bitcoin because Bitcoin is threatening but to them. But fun thought, if he's at that point using arguments that are so flawed, which side is yeah. winning? The, and think? that's my point is like because Bitcoin is so integral as we've described, mm. you don't there's no integral argument against it. Yeah. There's no rational, like human advancing argument against it. Yeah. Because it is human advancing. But to go back so to So you the, have to go to these ridiculous counter arguments. But to go back to the beginning of this conversation when we talked about narrative, when people hear you say that, mm. they will be like, Yeah, of course he says that because he's into Bitcoin. Of course. You know, so that's it's very, magic, you, the you, you also open up. I'm also talking my own book. That's true. Yeah, but it would be weirder if you wouldn't own Bitcoin and talk of, about Bitcoin. Of so, course, you know. yeah, it would be ridiculous. But I think we have the task to think and strategize about this yes. even more because with what you just said, like, obviously I agree, yeah. but you open up the frame yes. of, of conversation where someone could say like, yeah, of course you say that, like it's a non-argument. Sure. And this is why I think it has to be an invitation because yes. ultimately, yeah. obviously my opinion, we hold the moral high ground. Yeah, We're operating inside of the game that cannot be gamed. Yes. Yeah. Jamie Dimon is operating a game that is actively gamed all the time. Like By you him. Don't, <laughs> I always say, if you don't understand yeah. the game yeah, yeah, being yeah. played, then you are the game being yeah. played. Yeah. 
So like, and, and that's for you to go figure out on your own. Like, go look into banking and central banking and Wall yeah, Street, yeah. and then look into Bitcoin, and yeah. you decide. Yeah. I, I don't need to be the one to tell you. But this is also why I think Bitcoin is an individual mind virus, yes, in a sense. That's exactly. also why it will take a long time. Uh, th there are several factors that I think could accelerate once people realize, for example, in 2033, 99% of all Bitcoin are mined, mm -hmm. you know, and the last mm -hmm. percent is a rounding error over the next 107 years. So that... That could accelerate once more people know that. Sure. But again, you know, that's yeah. the individual and inflation mindfires. can accelerate. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, I have one example that I use for you know. Let's say you work at uh, IRS mm -hmm. and you have to uh, you get a list of fifty bitcoiners that you have to call. You know, known known bitcoin uh, bitcoiners according to some analysis, mm -hmm. whatever. And you call them up and say like, hey, uh, my paper here says you own this amount of Bitcoin, you have to pay this amount of taxes. And, you know, the person on the other side laughs and says like Bitcoin. Oh, yeah, I did something with Bitcoin. Yeah, there's like this code. Um, I don't know. Yeah, like I lost it when I went boating. Like mm -hmm. my, my, my wallet thingy, USB mm -hmm. thingy went, went overboard. Yeah, I don't know. Like I don't have it. Mm -hmm. oh, 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 okay. And then, you know, the IRS guy calls the other 49 Bitcoiners and they all say <laughs> the same thing, right? Imagine this person, this individual, you know, hanging up you know gathering his stuff at the end of the day and be like what, what who are these people like why why yeah. are they not impressed with me calling why do they all say they lost the thing <laughs> why why do they ask me to prove that they actually own it that's a weird you no know, he has a weird day and then he goes to the supermarket and the watermelon is 25 dollars you know and the yeah, bread is five dollars yeah. and you know eventually one by one people will realize you know that they cannot ignore inflation yeah one and that too, the people that move to another money system yeah. are winning. They're more hopeful. Yeah. They discount the future less. Mm -hmm. They are trying to build. They are trying to talk. They're mm -hmm. trying to share. They're trying to invite people mm -hmm. to think about this thing of what uh, the question of what is, what is money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, the loyalty to yourself and your individual life is eventually way higher than to any yes. ag agency or, or organization yes. or whatever yes. thing that you uh, belong to just because you applied <laughs> one day right. and you got the you got this job right yeah. so i i i, I th that's why i think I, I didn't like the bitcoin is inevitable yeah. uh, expression before but th this is why i do think it's inevitable because the this other system it's just flawed. It's flawed from the start. Yeah. You know, the fiat money system is a, is a flawed system for the ma majority of people that are forced to use the fiat money. So over time, once they see that Bitcoin is a mirror yeah. to this this broken system, and it's a totally different system, right? It's the paradigm shift that Jeff Booth talks about. It's it's you cannot ignore it anymore. No. It's not even part of the system that you are part of. So it's yeah, it's gonna act like a mirror. I think yeah no, that's fantastic framing that it, yeah it's it's converting people one at a time because i what the best what someone said something like the best thing about evil is that it self-destructs you know like this system however you define evil i mean there's a lot of different definitions i guess but the fact that you are taking something from people without their consent mm -hmm. you're taking purchasing power from savers without their consent through the yeah. printing of money yeah Okay, maybe evil's too strong of a word, but bad, not favorable to savers. And you said this is not to the benefit of most people using fiat. I would say no one it's to no one's benefit using also the not currency. the people in control eventually over time. It, eventually, not, even yeah. the people that are yeah, benefiting yeah, yeah, yeah. from it, well, they're gonna collapse the system. Mm -hmm. And when you know you have utter economic calamity, that's in no one's mm -hmm. best interest. Um so that realization is dawning on people with like every dollar or cent of of price appreciation like the more pain people mm. are feeling and then you, that you're simultaneously seeing more pain impressed on people that aren't adopting bitcoin but that pain is commensurate to the benefit that bitcoiners are <laughs> experiencing yeah so it's like you get this two-sided thing mm. where it's like we're you know if i'm just you know, dollar using Dave over here. I'm getting driven into the ground more while I'm watching, you know, Bitcoin Barry over here get lifted more and more and more. It's like, at what point do you capitulate and yeah. say, I, okay, I have made a mistake here. I think there's a, uh, there's a hope element to that. And I don't really like hope as a, 
as a strategy, to be honest. But I, I do hope that people wake up yeah. to that. But I also think because the, the this current paradigm or the system that people are participating in is so confusing, so everything that you would want to learn about the system is so obfuscated, the basic question is mm. never answered, mm. that it, it will be really hard for people to get to that point where they where they actually realize that yeah they're subject of a game that they don't even know they're playing yeah and yeah i don't know how we can facilitate that so that's i think is the only part for me about the future of bitcoin or money or the outcome of you know the, the spiritual war mm -hmm. that we talked about that that is a bit unclear before starting the What Is Money show, I spent most of my career as a CFO, overseeing internal technology implementations and business acquisitions. Over the next 10 years, it is projected that over 12 million businesses in the US will be sold. If you are an operator running a business generating between five and $200 million of revenue, and you're considering selling your business within the next decade, then there is a significant opportunity for you to deploy technology to streamline business processes reduce operating costs, and enhance the multiple your business ultimately sells for. To this end, I am partnering with the team at Emerge Dynamics, a firm with decades of experience in maximizing the value of privately held small and middle market businesses. Go to EmergeDynamics.com slash BreedLove to learn how you can build an attractive, high multiple company that maximizes your return when you fully exit. Again, that's Emerge Dynamics dot com slash breed love this december 17th to 21st 2024 join me on the pacific coast of mexico for our men's retreat the art of alpha at this world-class retreat center we will have daily meditations movement practices yoga cold plunging infrared sauna and many other biohacking modalities all while enjoying world-class cuisine designed for optimal full body health the Retreat Center is a gorgeous biohacker's paradise located right on the ocean. You can think of this place as a nervous system reset facility. At the Art of Alpha, we are seeking men who wish to cultivate freedom, wisdom, sovereignty, physical fitness, truth, and love in themselves and in those who look up to them. If you've always felt motivated to push yourself to new limits to discover the best version of yourself, but you've struggled to find the right community to immerse yourself in, then the Art of Alpha is for you. To apply to join the Art of Alpha, go to breedloveevents.com. Again, that's breedloveevents.com to apply to join us for the Art of Alpha on the Pacific coast of Mexico this December 17th through 21st, 2024. Who knows how quickly it's going to be, but there's going to be a point at which most of the world is no longer thinking in terms of dollars for mm. instance and most of the world is thinking in terms of sats right they will have actually transitioned mentally like their cognitive software will have uninstalled the dollar and installed yeah. bitcoin um, now of course i'm not saying this happens overnight it's you know to a greater or lesser extent it already probably exists for bitcoiners i know i try to like I say if it doesn't doesn't make sats and it doesn't make sense, right? If my net worth in Bitcoin terms is not going up, then mm. I'm doing something wrong because I could just hold Bitcoin and sit on my ass all day and you know be yeah. flat. So if you're if you're if you're not denominating for me, if I'm not denominating my net worth in satoshis and that amount's not going up, then I'm not working intelligently or hard enough. Mm. I think that realization has to dawn on people if this thing continues to monetize. So what? what does that look like like are people is that the, the realization you're kind of just describing is that people are going to just be shocked one day or i do think so because if we would only want to hire people and pay them with bitcoin and we know that that's the hardest money to ever exist and that probably the bitcoin that i spend I, I will probably not get get back or I know I have to work equally hard for what I spent to to earn that back in you know however I earn mm -hmm. uh, my Bitcoin right so if that's the case and 
I want to hire someone again, well, to build the shed or do something in mm -hmm. the house or do whatever for me. I'm going to scrutinize the value that they propose to, to deliver to me. I'm going to be very strict in my due diligence or however you want to mm -hmm. call it to figure out, is this the person that I want to buy from to exchange my, my, my sets with, mm. and that will confront the people that will give their value proposition to you, you know, what, whatever that is. And yeah, if, if, if they realize after, you know, uh, 50 leads <laughs> where everyone is like, well, I have Bitcoin and uh, your offer is not good enough, so I'm not gonna hire you. Yeah. They're going to have to rethink what they are doing. And I think People might say that that's a bad thing, but mm -hmm. eventually, you know, with all the spiritual stuff we talked about, I think that's a good that's a good thing because maybe you're doing something that you suck at and you didn't realize it mm -hmm. before, and you were able to rent seek mm -hmm. up until now by doing something that, yeah, is is something that people don't actually want, which, yeah, I think is spiritually or conscious. You know, when you talk about conscious, it's a very good thing. I think that will elevate your awareness of yourself and make you think about what you're here to actually do or, or contribute. So over time, I think that's a, that's a good thing, but yeah, I kind of see, yeah, that, that will probably be a shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. What do you think? Indeed. No, yeah. I, yes, quite the shock. And if it, the faster it happens, the more shocking, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, if you that's have, why I think it will take a long time. I, I don't know. I feel very uncertain about this topic because inflation's transition into hyperinflation is pretty quickly historically. That is true. And you're just a few hyperinflations away from Bitcoin mm. becoming the de facto standard. And so if, you know, I don't, do those happen in different places at different times? And then also because we're in such an interconnected age and we have such access to the lessons of history, <clears throat> how many hyper countries do we need to see hyperinflate and then move on to a harder money before like the next country starts to realize, yeah. oh shit, um, that's how this works. Yeah, yeah. That and I they start to front run the whole thing. Yeah, and you front run it, that actually causes it, right? You, if you, this is yes. the weird thing about inflation yeah, 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 is yeah, that yeah, it's yeah. a psychological phenomenon. Yeah. First, that mm -hmm. if you expect the currency to depreciate into the future, your natural inclination is going to be to sell the currency and buy something that's not going to be inflated. Yep that actually causes the inflation of the currency. Yes. I, again, I don't like using the word, the depreciation of the currency. Yes, yes, yes. So it's a, I don't like the word belief either, but there is a belief component. Like if enough pe people believe this currency is going to depreciate, then you can bet your ass it's going to depreciate because yeah. they will express that thesis by selling it and yes, causing it to yes. depreciate. I agree. I, I Yes, I 100% agree. I think it's an interesting uh, um, idea because why I say that I think it will go slowly is because what we talked about before, people don't even have time to think or, or talk mm -hmm. for a few hours like we're mm -hmm. doing now, right? To really contemplate, you know, how does this work? Does it work for me? No, what is better? Like all, all, all these things that we talked about. But yes, there will be a point where people realize that the debt will never be paid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the global debt or the debt of the US mm -hmm. will never be paid. Mm -hmm. And people won't want to buy that debt anymore. Yeah. And you know, if the U.S. is forced to buy their own debt and print money just to keep up, supposedly the system, yeah. um, then then people will realize that. Yeah, I I also think this is hard to maybe it was too quick to judge, but it's also hard to predict because we are actually living through something that only happens. You know, what does Ray Dalio say? Two hundred fifty or three hundred mm -hmm. uh, yeah. years. You know, or when you, what you talked about with Brandon, uh, Brandon with the with the fourth turning, yeah. it's just really hard to realize that we are living through this and yeah. that we can talk about this and share this with yes. others. Like in the the previous time that yeah. this happened, it was a shock, more of a shock, yes. because less people were informed about the fact that this was even uh, occurring. I think so. Yeah, I agree with you that the speed of the internet might. You know, and, and the information distribution might accelerate. Yeah, we've already this. seen maybe glimmers of that with the <clears throat> Silicon Valley bank run, right? Where it was just a rumor that this thing's going to collapse. Yeah, it was like, like five people. <laughs> yeah, talking, yeah, right. And because yeah. it's all online, yeah. like yeah. liquidity moves a lot faster in mm. the digital age. So, what does that mean for hyperinflation and Bitcoinization? I I would think it's probably an accelerant, but who knows? 
I, I want to, I, because I agree strongly with something you said, though, that these jobs that are probably going to be eliminated in the wake of Bitcoin, right? You brought up the IRS guy. Um, you could also throw in like Wall Street investment bankers in here. Like, I don't want to say eliminated, but the amount that they will earn should be substantially less in a non-fiat world. Yeah. Uh, they make a disproportionate share of income basically in a in a financialized or fiat world where yeah. it wouldn't be the case in Bitcoin. I would also put AI into this conversation because yes. that seems to be threatening to a lot of, you know, legal, accounting, consulting type professions, possibly even software engineering, like who knows. But I I don't want to overgeneralize here, but a lot of these professions and people that I've seen in them, they tend to not like their job so much, right? I think it's, inf now that you're saying this, I think that is information arbitrage. They are they are using information arbitrage. Yes. Like people know how to code and That's other right. people don't. That's, That's why right. they earn more. Yes. Right? But it's not, pro what they get as a reward is not proportionate to the value that. That's right. That it's kind of deliver. a rent seeking in a way. Yeah, because they have information that other people have don't an or knowledge, yeah. right? And, and and that's why they can but profit. But AI from it. and Bitcoin reduce these asymmetries. Yes, I think so. Yeah, and but you already see that in my country, uh, plumbers, uh, yeah, uh, people that that work with their hands, you know, like carpenters, all, all those wages, uh, car mechanics, yeah. all those wages are going up. Yeah. So you already kind of see that that shift. But yeah, I I agree with AI like that. that all that stuff converging. Now together, I think. Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask, because that I mean, people are scared of that, like oh, job destruction and humans going to have nothing to do and blah blah blah. Like I'm not concerned about any of that. I think we mm -hmm. always find something to do, and if it increases human productivity, that means it makes us more prosperous. That means we're solving problems better, faster, cheaper. That's all a net win to me. Does it mean though that we could perhaps? Could this be a key ingredient to the elevation of human consciousness? Is that people stop doing things they don't like to do so much? We just did this retreat in Mexico a month ago. And as simple as this sounds, but it was very profound for me, uh, we're doing like a lot of nervous system retraining and a lot of it, you know, there's actual physical movements, breath work, but then there's also neurological work mm -hmm. where you're asking yourself, oh, this thing triggers me. Why does it trigger me? The guy was telling us that triggers are trailheads that you actually start down this path typically yeah. ends up at a childhood trauma of some yes. kind and yes. you can resolve it and you gain more freedom because you gain more control of yourself but one of the most profound things that came out of all of that um uh programming basically that we were doing he's like if your life is not satisfactory enough just try doing more things that you like every day just th that sounds ridiculously simple, but it actually landed with me so good. He's like, he's like, I know people that are, you know, super rich and they're running around like pulling their hair out and they're stressed out all the time. Mm -hmm. He goes, then I go to this other guy's house because he was uh, consulting for these different people. He's like, this other guy's house and he's super rich. And he's like, hey, come check out my fish tank. Yeah. You know, like I'm really into these fish. And yeah, just go, yeah, yeah. Isn't this cool? But he knows, he knows what he wants or what he likes. It's yeah. what we talked about. But he's in just the beginning. doing things that yes. lights him up, yeah. right? And so, so where I was going with that question is, isn't that the way to create a better world or to at least support the elevation of human consciousness yep. is you get more people doing things that light them up mm -hmm. rather than doing these bullshit paper yeah. pushing jobs. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. I, 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 I totally believe that. I have to think about, you know, all these UBI ideas, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. again, creating some monetary rules to give everyone money and then, you know, people will figure out what they really like. You know, I, I think there's different experiments already that show that yeah. it doesn't work. But what I think this convergence of AI, uh, the, you know, all the quantum stuff and and Bitcoin as the apolitical, trustless, yeah. uh, et cetera, you know, non-sovereign way to exchange value between all these systems will actually create also over time. So again, I don't I don't I don't think we should speculate on how fast that goes, mm -hmm. but eventually it will create a base layer of life quality for everyone mm -hmm. that gives them the time and space that we mentioned before mm -hmm. to actually figure out what do I enjoy? Why am I here? What is going on? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some people that are, that would be super uh, good in uh, 
the philosophy uh, of life or think mm-hmm. about consciousness mm-hmm. and, and, and all these things, but they're stuck in some dead end job. Yeah, investment just, banker, just, yeah. Right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I, I 100% uh, agree with this because if there is this base layer of life quality for everyone, then we can actually start going back to mm-hmm. questioning what what, it, mm-hmm. what is going on mm-hmm. here. That's also, I, I always think about this when you think about like uh, when you had hunter-gatherers way back, mm-hmm. right? They say like society started when the hunter-gatherers had a sur- surplus mm-hmm. and not everyone had to hunt or Right. or gather right and these people could start cultivating ground or building homes or yeah, yeah. whatever they had savings <clears throat> yeah no, exactly no. and my thought is and i wonder what you think what would be the first question that you know if if we were these two guys that that didn't have to go out to hunt or gather and we would sit and we would talk about well what should we think about now <laughs> you know what sh- what should we do what what uh, i'll sh- i'll share mine but i i wonder what you think what what do you think what's the most rational thought that would come up what they would start thinking about or, or like learning. Or and you're asking about these hypothetical guys yes. that just got the economic yes. surplus. I'll, I'll tie it to, to the um, Okay. Well, one thing that immediately came to mind because it ties into that uh, initial production of an economic surplus was they had to figure out how to defend it. Mm. That was also the origin point of government, I think. Mm. Like you need a protection system. Like, well, we got all the grains in the silo or whatever it is. Mm. But if you don't put a fence and guards around that, well, then the neighbors are going to come take it, basically. So you kind of have the the genesis of government. Yeah. So maybe they're thinking about that. Like, how do we defend the surplus that we just created? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I would guess religious, philosophical. I, I think they would look up and think, like, what is going on here? Mm. Like, what is this fireball that comes mm-hmm. up? and goes down mm-hmm. you know and then the flowers start and mm-hmm. at one point you know there's more rain and then there's snow then all the children die mm. and the food perishes right mm-hmm. and then it happens again and again mm. and this fireball comes again and we see the stars and all the alignments and all the you know it's it's the same but yeah. it's different and it's like you know like i f- i think they would be drawn to this question of what what is the reality or what is yes. going on right and there's a book that says leisure is the basis of civilization. I think it goes mm. in hand. Well, I, I think yeah. that ties in yeah. with this, right? Because yeah. if you have time to not worry about your safety yeah. or your food or your children's safety or your children's food, right? So the progression of yeah. your your progeny or your, your, your yes. protecting your biological urge and the, and the product of that, right? Yes. Yeah, I think the first intellectual path would be to figure out what's what <laughs> yes. what is this yeah, what yeah, is yeah, yeah. what is that solving right. bigger problems yeah more fundamental problems the, the, yeah i don't know if it's is less it, immediate is it, a, is it a problem i don't know if it's a problem it's more like the the quest of the intellect or something yeah. like to, to, to i mean it is to, a problem you said when the children die and the crops oh finish, yeah 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 no know? i mean like, like that that is a problem but yeah. i mean like once that is uh, well, yeah, that is the problem, right? Yeah. Like, why does that happen? Yeah. Will it keep happening? Yeah. How, how how long is the time between this and that? Exactly. What is time? How do yes. I measure? Yes. <laughs> you know, right. all, all these things. And so I feel that, or I could, you know, conceptualize a moment in time where if if the base need, basic needs of people are actually covered, mm. so also the housing is affordable yeah. and all these things, yeah that we could start getting back to to that point where we could collectively yeah. figure out you know what is going on yeah. here? what am i doing in this meat suit and yeah. uh, you know where do the thoughts come from yeah. and, and all these things yeah no, it's it's a beautiful picture and then it, you know you could what are you saying is like basically humans will have more freedom or more leisure mm-hmm. more free time yeah and that is i i fully agree with this i mean uh, was it google that does it at the workplace like they tried to have their employees 30 yeah, percent like the, of yeah, their yeah, time yeah. was yeah. like you do whatever you want mm. because that's where a lot of the innovation and good ideas comes from as you can't you can't pressure cook that you know mm. you can't socially plan that you can't centrally plan that or socially engineer that you really have to let people be free and this yeah. is the beauty of human freedom is that we figure shit out beautifully when we're left to our own devices but um a world bitcoin slash ai enabled world where goods and services are becoming much cheaper and therefore standards of living are more affordable and higher just giving people more leisure yeah i think that could lead to 
kind of a philosophical renaissance. And in addition to AI and Bitcoin already being very philosophically tantalizing in and of themselves, right? Just the fact that people can communicate with each other more quickly and communicate mm -hmm. with these tools, not yeah. Bitcoin, but with AI specifically. Like I've had some full-blown arguments with ChatGBT already, right? right? Yeah. And that, so that's a whole philosophical yeah. Uh, motivator there so like you put all these things together and it's like yeah the digital age really starts to look mm. fascinating well and if you think about uh you know the, the big thinkers like einstein and newton i think they and there's more but they explicitly share that all their big discoveries came from when they went mm. back to playing and acting yes. like like their child self yes without all the yes all the influence from you know yes. the, the the world of yes. you know uh, listening to uh, what other people think of you and yes. just going back to that playful uh discovery and curiosity that 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 acting like that actually led them to you know the discoveries that they made and i think that ties into what we talked about before the the, the spiritual corruption you know you being more into you know the the physical life and all the distractions and all these things instead of how do I get back to my childlike self, as you yes. said, like through all the traumas and through all the things yeah, yeah, yeah. that, you know, uh, and everyone has trauma to a different degree. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, uh, well, Gro growth, so, growth is traumatic. Everyone's yeah, but like yeah. you're also raising a kid and you're doing that to the best of your mm -hmm. ability. And I'm doing the same, but I always believe that you will, uh, eventually everyone messes up themselves in, in, in a way. Yeah. Right. That doesn't, in, in some cases, of course, that, is really uh, tied back to how a parent acted, right? Yeah. But if you did your best with all your love, eventually, so, you know, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but people mess themselves up. Sure. They block themselves towards the future. You have these traumas, but yeah. once you have the time and space to alleviate yourself from yes. that and you can go back to your true self, yes. that's when I think we will also have more attempts and more success at, you know, yeah, these these bigger questions. Yeah. I love that. I love that you brought up <coughs> Einstein and was it Feynman? You said that when they got back to their child, Newton, like yeah. Newton, when they got into their the spirit of their inner child, that they started to make these breakthrough discoveries. I shared with you before we recorded uh, one of my favorite Eastern philosophers, Krishnamurti. Mm. Um, the book that he has several books, but the one that I really enjoyed was Think on These Things, and. Um, I don't know if this is from this book, but he has a quote that's something like the first time a child labels a bird a bird is the last time he sees that particular bird. Mm -hmm. So it's your once you put this linguistic layer, this labeling layer on, you sort of start dissociating from the qualitative reality that every bird is as individual as every human, right? Yeah. But we just call them bird, right? We just, You're indexing instead yeah, of connecting. Just, exactly. We just index yeah. them and sort of push them into the mm. subconscious and go on becoming yeah. an adult. And another thing that uh, one of the therapists that I talked to said that I thought was really interesting is that what he'll say to a lot of his patients when they come to him, and you know, if they're, they're whatever their issue is, anger, anxiety, depression, one of the, his first questions will be, when did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? Yeah. When did you stop playing? Yeah. You know, like just when did you lose touch with your inner child, that playful discovery oriented self? And that tends to be uh, a very telling, a very entry, a very interesting trailhead, let's say, mm. into uh, therapy for, you know, at least his approach. And so it's not just what gives you fulfillment, you know, you actually have a happy life to the degree you, you're in touch with this inner playful self, but it's also this place where we get great discoveries and great insight. You're almost like below language, mm. you know, it's like when you're looking at every bird as a bird, yeah. you're more likely to figure out, I don't know, the theory of relativity or whatever it may be. Well, when you say this, I think about what, what is the distraction that I created? Mm for myself hmm. and you you mentioned triggers before i think <clears throat> i gave you a book uh untethered soul mm -hmm. and in that book uh, michael singer talks about uh, uh a trigger being a blue mustang that your ex-girlfriend owned <laughs> or something and every time you see the blue mustang you think 
about oh, yeah. you know the sadness that you had when she broke up with you or yeah. etc and he describes that the triggers are not the, the problem the, the trigger is the pathway to some sort of energy that you stored like an emotion that you didn't really mm-hmm. live through mm-hmm. and uh, I once read that children can go through their emotions in like 90 seconds, live through their emotions mm. in 90 seconds. Mm. So if they feel anger or sadness and you really let them go mm. through it, then after 90 seconds, it's also gone. Mm. So but true. I- imagine you <clears throat> you didn't do that to some degree or you, uh, yeah, I always kind of say like you gave that to yourself. Right. You made something of a situation that, you know, you had a thought and you turned that into an emotion mm-hmm. and then you started acting in a certain way. Mm-hmm. You basically put that energy mm-hmm. in in your body, and it's stuck in your body. Exactly, yeah. and it and it takes space in your body that um, holds you back from putting other energy there, yeah. perhaps even more, you know, po- a positive energy. That's also kind of how I view therapies. When you get to that yes. point, it's like, what is the distraction that I gave myself? Why why am I paying attention to this blue Mustang mm. when this was twenty years ago or yeah. something like that? Like it doesn't serve. Um, a purpose anymore so yeah. once you do live through that you know whether that's therapy or we mentioned psychedelics yeah. or whatever you know i think there's different ways for for people to do that you open up yourself again to process it to new things and maybe yeah. then you can actually see the bird for for the bird it is yes. and, and not index it in the, yeah in the no, way that's yeah. fantastic because yeah so the child that processes the emotional energy quickly they're not putting all this complicated story to it, right? Yeah. And like mm. bottling it up or, you know, uh, what like hi, if they feel shame about it, they might. And of course, children do start to do this at some point. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know what age, but um, yeah. And th- there's a lot of um, spiritual practitioners that will tell you when you bottle those energies up, that's what becomes, that's what manifests as physical pathology at some mm-hmm. point. Yeah. So a lot of healing is actually, it's not just physically fixing whatever's in your body it's actually releasing these uh pent up emotions yeah. right that you have not that what have you done you've like tangled them in a linguistic knot and stuffed them down like it's like every time i see this blue mustang i feel the sadness again about this girl well, from 20 years the, ago um so but if you so, but if you re, yeah. if you reframe the story it's like oh wait i'm a human being i've done this now i i can identify it and let it go mm. you make the unconscious conscious you can like heal from it yeah, it's the, so this book is uh, Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the main takeaway I got from that is how he talks about the self. So you, he starts the book with um, when, you have, when you hear the thoughts in your head, mm-hmm. do you realize that you are not the one talking? Yeah, it's a big breakthrough right? so for you are, people. So you are the observer of, mm-hmm. of the thoughts. So you also are not your thoughts, Yes, you know, however bad the thoughts are. Mm-hmm. might be so the thoughts arise somewhere but you only only look at them mm-hmm. and he basically shares that if you are the observing self you observe he basically says like it's the self uh, thoughts emotions actions mm-hmm. and the thoughts and emotions are in your head and the actions are outside actions are also the words mm-hmm. that you use or the mm-hmm. behavior mm-hmm. that you show and it basically goes both ways so let's say you act in a certain way and i feel threatened or sad about that and then i m- create the thought like robert doesn't like me mm-hmm. the more i get into that instead of observing just mm-hmm, mm-hmm, whatever mm-hmm. you say the less centered i am that's how he talks about centeredness mm-hmm. centeredness is trying to stay the observer and if mm-hmm. you go too far from yourself so into actions so you act without thinking then you are not centered because you are acting upon the thoughts that created the emotions mm. and then and then your actions, but also the other way around. And once you, well, I, I adopted it after reading that book like like three times, but then you also start seeing that in other people, mm-hmm. other people that talk a lot about other people, for mm-hmm, example. Mm-hmm. They are talking outside yes. <laughs> of, of, of their mind. And so they are not centered. They are in, yes. invested in these other people yes. or into entertainment or, you know, um, Whatever, yeah. For me, that's been a really interesting way to look at it and also try uh, like a good way to realize that if I create, if I observe an emotion or some thought that I really get into based on whatever happens in uh, any interaction, that despite feeling the emotion, I try to go back to the rational uh, explanation of what I just said and Uh then think like, okay, but that's not me. 
So I, I don't even have to follow. If I follow this emotion, I'm not centered. Yeah. So that's kind of like, uh, yeah, I think that you, you were really into stoicism. I yeah, think. Like, exactly. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a bit similar to yeah. that, I think. No, I love that you brought that up because I read this, I think it was a quote by Buddha I read recently. It said, I am not what you think I am. You are what you think yes. I am. That like every observation or judgment mm -hmm. is simultaneously a confession of character. Yes. And that's a, that's a big meta step. I love and, the And very powerful because like, <laughs> yeah. I, there's so many people, like I, I'm sure many people have been the target of it. I've been the target of lots of criticism. And it's amazing to see how much of that, um, it well, oftentimes it's just untrue. Like people mm. will just say something that's just totally unfounded or untrue. And then if you just kind of sit and listen and let it play out for a time, it, they start to show that they are the actual, again, it's, I am not what you think I am. You are what you think I am. So you'll be accused yeah. of something. But then through time, that person's accusations will show to be true about themselves yes. rather than about the person they're yeah. accusing. So what triggers you is actually what you don't like about yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's funny, the synchronicity. Again, when I gave you the book, you're like, oh, I just, uh, you know, it yeah. was laying somewhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, we just had a here. friend in town that also just <coughs> brought it to oh, us. Nice. Yes. Well, this quote reminds me of something I read, I think yesterday on my flight, actually. It's like the, the image I have of myself only exists in myself. Mm -hmm. There's multiple me's. Yes. Your perception of me of is course. different than my yes. perception of myself. Yes. Or the people watching now have yeah. all have their individual perception of you. Yes. And they are not the same as how you perceive or That's look right. at, at yeah. yourself. So there is no you in that sense, in That's the right. construct That's right. sense. Yeah. Multiple, yeah I, I love that. Multiple I love shards, that yeah. But, but that helps in not caring i think exactly you know it's the like dissociation. it's it's, it's yeah. uh, you cannot control what other people think of you and it's yes. also i tell this to my uh, fiance a lot like i think it's so crazy that uh, if you are with a person in a relationship they see you like you never see yourself yes like they really see the you that's right more than you see yourself yes. i think that's very well and they thought. often know you better than you know yourself yes. or in ways you don't know yourself yes and that's the relationship provides a mirror yes by which you both get to know each other and yourself more deeply yes in an ideal situation yeah. and yeah the, the point you brought up there like uh rothbard said something like no one owns their reputation all right you can't own your reputation actually it's not yours mm. to control it's like you can you can choose to take actions in accordance with the principles you have adopted for yourself or you've you've said that you want to adhere to, but you can't control people's perception. Mm. And so, yeah, the stoic position is like, don't be attached to praise and don't be attached to ridicule because ultimately what you need to be attached to is your effort and your attitude. Yeah towards your purpose. Well, this is what's, what Rick Rubin says about what creation. What Rick Rubin says, that's right? where I was going to go next. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, it's like the art is not for the audience. The audience comes yeah. last. But you should make the thing to the best of your ability. Is make the says, art that right? you love. Yeah, but and to so, the best of your ability. To, of so course, that you, yeah. oh, yes, absolutely. Like it's, yeah, that you love, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to, it's actual, yeah. uh, uh, an expression of, yeah. of creation, right? It's like almost creating a child in a way. Yeah. But there's so many people in my opinion, that have that backwards. I see a lot of people in the world chasing the audience or chasing the attention yeah. rather than just like coming to that place of stillness you described and like just what is it you love? What is it you want to do? What is it you have to say? What is it you want to share? That is, and maybe that's what we talked about earlier, getting people out of these jobs they don't like and into a place of leisure where they can at least do more of what they want maybe we'll get more people coming from that place of authenticity and therefore get more art in the world, more, more love ultimately. Wouldn't that be a nicer place to live? Yeah. In, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I told you off, off cam that last week I was in a building that was 500 years old mm -hmm. and I thought, has there been anything been built the last 20 years that would survive the next 500 years, mm -hmm. right? Or when you go to, 16 chapel or like a nice church yeah. just the craftsmanship or the time and energy the limited time and energy that people put into creating something that was yeah. universally beautiful 
that most people would agree to is beautiful. I think that that's uh, something that people universally can recognize. Yeah. Yeah, we are so far away from that. Sorry, yeah. I don't want to be a downer no, now, no, but no, I think, no, you know, yeah. that's interesting that if we, I think how we talk is like, oh, yes, that is where we could go. Yeah. But where we are is pretty far away from from that. But that is why Bitcoin for me is also that hope, like Michael yes. Saylor says, like yeah. once we get to that place, how beautiful would that exactly. be? Exactly. Yeah. We have the bridge to get there. I think so. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful place to bring it to a close. I love this, man. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you for joining me. Um, we'll have to do this again. This was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, man. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to find more just like it and here to find our most recent episode. Also, make sure to like this video to help shine light on the corruption of money and be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected.